just say it over and over. I'm pretty sure it was your turn. One, two, this is the Portland Sustainability Commission, uh, Planning Sustainability Commission. Now it's on. Okay. Welcome, everybody. This is the November 19th Portland Planning and Sustainability Commission meeting. On the agenda today, we have items of interest from commissioners, followed by the director's report. Then we will go into work session on the design overlay zone amendments. That will be followed by the transportation system plan update, which is a hearing and a recommendation. And we will adjourn by 8. So items of interest. Yes, Chris. So I have a couple items. Uh, first, I would note that two people died of traffic violence last night in the city of Portland and a third in neighboring Fairview. So the epidemic continues. Uh, I had the honor of presenting two commission recommendations to City Council last week, last Wednesday. Uh, the first was bike parking, and I think Council is largely on track with our recommendation uh, with two exceptions. Uh, there are a number of minor amendments that I don't think substantively affect our recommendation, but they did carve out uh, actually a separate ordinance with 18 affordable housing projects that are 
uh, in the development pipeline and I think scheduled to get uh, housing bond proceeds used. Uh, and they are accepting those from uh, our recommendation. Uh, while I appreciate that they don't want to disrupt things that are in the planning pipeline, you know, I also regret that the residents of those 18 buildings won't benefit from the quality bike parking. Uh, the second, uh, probably less substantive issue, is that we had made a specific recommendation that details of the bike racks uh, be submitted in a later plan check phase, not at land use review. Uh, and apparently BDS convinced council to remove that provision, so uh, th those details would have to be submitted uh, along with all the other plans. Uh, the second recommendation was regarding the tree code. Uh, you'll recall that we voted to recommend extending the sunset date of the uh, protections for larger trees. Uh, we, along with staff, had recommended a two-year uh, extension. Um, Commissioner Udaley moved that to, ex to extend that exemption, extend the sunset date until 2050. And she would have she would have waived it entirely if uh, the city attorney had not told her that the item that was noticed was uh, a sunset date. So um, we also recommended uh, extending the, the, the protections for trees and development situations to uh, commercial and industrial zones. Uh, that's going to be heard separately on December 5th, and I think Eli will be representing us then. But um, several council members expressed some enthusiasm for that as well as for the Forestry Commission recommendation, which was to lower uh, the diameter of trees that would fall under those protections. So there seems to be uh, an appetite to beef up the tree code from what I could see at Council. Thanks. Thank you for sharing that, Chris. Any other items of interest? Nope. Okay. Director's report, Andrea. Great. Good evening. A couple of items to update everyone on. We are going to council tomorrow on the remanded fossil um, fuel zone amendment. So that'll be at council tomorrow for a public hearing and then um, scheduled for a vote on December 18th. Uh, we have our next um, Better Housing by Design um, meeting uh, with council on uh, Thursday, this Thursday, and then a scheduled, we expect the vote on December 5th. And then residential infill work session starts on December 11th. Um, so we'll start with a work session at council then. And then the um, hearings will uh, happen in mid-January uh, and continue uh, through uh, later that month. So that's what's coming up in council right now. A couple of other updates on just some logistical issues. One is um, thank you to Oriana and to Katie who volunteered to be on the Budget Advisory Committee. We have room for one more. So if anyone would like to join, um, the first meeting is December 4th. We'll probably, it'll be four total meetings, um, but we do, um, we'll appreciate input and guidance from the PSC and other members of the Budget Advisory Committee as we um, develop um, BPS's budget for next, uh, proposal for next year. You will also be receiving a message from Julie. We're going to propose a mini retreat for the Planning Sustainability Commission for early January. We're looking at January 6th, 7th, or 8th in the afternoon. So um, please respond to Julie's email about that. She will send that um, after, um, tomorrow to get a sense of cal uh, your calendars and availability. But we'd like to kind of bring everyone together again and, and um, have a retreat and kind of look ahead at our plans for next year. And uh, the, if you have not yet confirmed your email records retention, uh, please be sure to fill out that form and submit it to Julie. Um, we're happy to help with folks, but we need to get that confirmation. So that is it. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Andrea. So the next item on the agenda is the design overlay zone amendments work session. Uh, BPS staff will use a presentation to orient us and keep us on track for today's discussion. I'd like to welcome Chandra Robinson to present, uh, she's here to present the Design Commission's testimony on parts of DOZA that are within the PSC's review. Um, their first set work session is going, or was November 7th, sorry. Um, at the last meeting, commissioners shared their potential conflicts of interest and we will do so again. 
While it's not clear whether the proposal changes um, create a potential conflict of interest for PSC members because the changes affect such a broad category and class of property owners, in the interest of transparency, we have the following declarations. Commissioner Smith owns property in the design overlay zone. Commissioner Schultz, Spivak, Bortolazzo, and Lawrence Spence work for architectural or development firms who conduct work in Portland. So I believe that is it, and we're ready for you guys to take the lead. Welcome. Thank you. There you go. Hello, I'm Sandra Wood with the Bureau of Planning and Sustainability, and I am um, working on the DOZA project along with Laura Lillard, my colleague, and Phil Nemany. Um, before we have um, Commissioner Robinson share her the Design Commission's testimony, I just wanted to give you an overview of how we're planning to spend our time today. This is our first work session that we're really getting into the, the work that we're doing today. Um, so we're going to roll up our sleeves, and I want to make sure everybody has a copy of Volume 2 with you. Um, and if you don't, please raise your hand and we will get an extra copy to you because we'll be flipping through pages as we're having our discussions today. Um, but what we're planning on doing is after Commissioner Robin, uh, Robinson gives uh, the Design Commission's um, testimony, Phil will share the testimony closed on, um, on Friday and he'll share what um, the amount of testimony we got and what categories the testimony was in. And as you know, for DOZA, we're or organizing our proposals around five topics. We're hitting three of the topics today, which is purpose, map, and thresholds. We have some times allotted on the side, which um, will help um, um, Commissioner Schultz keep us on track for that. And then at the end, we'll um, talk about our next work session and maybe talk about the um, standards. So um, that's what we have outlined for you today. And with that, I'll hand it to Commissioner Robinson. You know, real quick, sorry, Chandra. Just um, one thing I did want to, I think, make clear to everybody is that we're not anticipating any emotions or amendments today. This is a work session amongst ourselves, so don't feel like you have to have that all prepared for a discussion. Sorry about the interruption, That's please. That's quite all right. Thank you. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. I'm representing the Design Commission today. We did submit um, a letter last week which outlined our comments on the Design Overlay Zone amendments. And today I'm just going to offer a little bit more information, some highlights and things that we think are important to consider as you um, go through your work sessions. So initially, uh, one of the most important things is to consider why we even do the design reviews. And we're really trying to create a Portland that in the future everyone will feel safe and proud to walk those streets. And so we're really thinking about the future every time we review buildings, that it's about generations of buildings. They need to be right because we're all growing. Every area of the city is growing very rapidly and we want to make sure that there are um, guidelines in place to, to guide that. So I'll, I'll go through a few of the, the items that I know you're going to review today as well. So for the purpose, the purpose statement, we really feel like the purpose statement as written, it was um, revised recently, is very clear and strong and accessible. It focuses right now on the three tenets of design, which are context, public realm, and then quality and resilience. And all of those things are the foundation of the design review process, and they make it very clear when applicants come into the design hearing, the design review hearing, what we are focusing on so that they can properly prepare and anticipate um, what kind of design is going to serve the public the best. So we do feel like it also upholds a lot of the new comprehensive plan goals. And the only thing that would make it even better is if we use a little bit of language in there that said the three tenets of design. Um, when planners are talking to applicants about it, that is what they are saying, and they're making that very clear. So we think that right now it's clear. It could just be emphasized a tiny bit more, but it's very good as is. Um, considering the map, we think that it would be great if the um, the the work to do the commercial storefront study, the low-rise commercial storefront study, could be prioritized. So even if that's not something that happens you know, in this uh, zone amendment uh, timeframe, it needs to happen soon because 
like I said before, all of these uh, neighborhoods are growing very quickly and there could be a lot of changes that start to happen if we haven't sort of um, set a baseline for what's there now and what we're expecting to see in the future. Um, related to the thresholds, um, we're considering the blanket exemption for an alteration of a storefront of 200 square feet or less to be much too generous. Um, it would be, I think, in all of our best interests if we would consider that exemption for only for non-street facing or for non-public plaza or publicly uh, dedicated open space facing areas. You can make a lot of changes to a building incrementally in 150 square feet that doesn't have to go through any review and that could happen several times and really change what's happening at the ground level and end up with a product with a building with a street that is much less active and therefore feels less safe and doesn't do what it needs to do for the public realm. Um, in the design standards, um, I guess we're looking at table 420, and I'm going back and forth between a couple of these things, but uh, there's, there's a, an amend, part of the amendment is to allow 400, or f sorry, 40,000 square feet as a threshold for um, commercial buildings, and then also giving a limit of uh, 55 feet in height. Um, Allowing buildings up to 40,000 square feet to use only the standards could have significant impacts on the neighborhood context. Those can be very large buildings. Um, and previously, the threshold was 20,000 square feet, which seems more reasonable. It's a much smaller building if it's not going through design review. Um, the fit, there's also um, an area that shows that the height limit is 55 feet. This is already allowed. It's not a change, and so we're not proposing that that is a change. But maintaining this threshold makes sense, um, and it, it ensures that the buildings taller than 55 feet, which are gonna have a much greater impact on the neighborhood context of growing communities, something very tall can just pop up, and make sure that those are reviewed with the public allowed to participate by coming to design review hearings and DARs to hear what is happening in their neighborhood. And that's very important to Design Commission that we maintain a level of um, change that still allows the public to come and comment and let us know how they feel about changes in their neighborhood. Um, the procedures for type two design review proposals or for, for the types of design review proposals, we feel that a type three um, design process for alterations in the Central City Plan District is, um, is too aggressive. The staff does a very good job of vetting projects and reviewing them based on the guidelines and making sure that those alterations meet the standards that, they are, that the guidelines that they are required to. Um, additionally, if those, if it was a type three, it gets appealed to city council and we don't feel that city council is the appropriate place for a storefront alteration to end up if it is denied um, by design review. So our suggestion is that it goes to a type two so that in, in appeal it can be reviewed by the design commission instead of, of city council. Um, considering, considering affordable housing projects, um, there's an option there for a type two design review without a design advice request for affordable housing. And we feel that that is inequitable and not acceptable because people who live in affordable housing um, that is built or renovated with public do dollars should really live in building buildings that are compatible in all ways with neighboring buildings, that they're not they can't use an excuse of, of not having enough money and making this affordable housing to not um, live up to the guidelines. So they need to be compatible in all ways with the neighboring buildings. And anything less risks stigmatizing households so that you can tell that something is built for less money and is less quality. It stigmatizes those households of people who live in affordable housing. And it also risks people saying that they don't want an affordable housing project in their neighborhood because it may not be uh, the same quality. And it really, without um, 
without allowing for a DAR, it lessens the opportunity for everyone to participate in that public process. Also related to um, processes, the design advice requests. We really support um, removing the limit on the number of design advice requests because we, we really use those not to make any decisions but to make sure that any sort of lower performing projects, projects that aren't meeting the guidelines and living up to what we require for the public realm, the context, and the design coherency, they have such a big effect on their neighborhoods that we want them to be able to come in as many times as they need to to sort of understand how to get their building to perform the way it needs to for the public specifically. Um, related to the FARs, we think that it's sensible to guarantee whatever allowed FAR there is for a project because um, that is economically driven. It's also very sensible to not include setbacks and heights in our design review because they're the cornerstone of how you approach designing a responsive building on a site. By not including height and setbacks, we're not saying that developers can't build up to those allowances. We're saying that it's important to think about where the heights and the setbacks occur on a site. Um, when you relate to so many different things around the site, the contacts, the other buildings, open spaces, um, natural features, the height and the setback should stay malleable so that the allowed FAR can fit into the site in a, in a thoughtful way and allow some flexibility there. Um, I understand that you're not going into the tools and the standards today, but um, in our letter we have outlined additional information about the tools and standards, so I invite you to take a look at those when you get a chance, and also feel free, the Design Commission would be happy to um, come in again or invite you to a separate meeting to discuss more of those if, if you have questions or anything. We're happy to sort of review them again. It's a, there's a lot of information in there, obviously. Um, in general, the strong standards are really the backbone of the D overlay, and we understand like all of this work that we're doing is to make sure that the standards and the guidelines align so that we're getting to the same end result, even if a project is not going through design review. And I think that um, that work has, it's a tremendous amount of work that's been done. Um, we just need to make sure that we're calibrating the right number of points assigned to the different standards so that we are incentivizing the things that we feel are very important that support the public realm and um, not de-incentivizing, de but really making sure that it's clear what's most important in an area. And while we feel that um, sustainability and lots of other, um, there's a lot of things that are really important to building, but we wanna make sure that the guidelines and the standards are really aligned in all of those ways. Um, talking about context, what would be great is if we could update the character statements for neighborhoods. Um, those, if we, we look at uh, C7 through C10, Historic Landmarks Commission has done a lot of work reviewing those about buildings that are um, coming up next to a building that's 50 years or older, or it's an alteration of one, or it's in the same neighborhood and somehow relates to it. And so we really agree with the statements um, put forward in the Landmarks Commission's letter that they, they provided as well. Um, and those are all about preserving um, buildings in, our, uh, in the future. That buildings that aren't necessarily historically um, stand out right now, but in the future they may be. They're, they're still there, they were built well, they're part of the neighborhood fabric, and they should be respected as well. Um, thinking about items in the public realm, there's the ground floor heights specifically are not really uh, on par with what the guidelines are expecting, and we are hoping that um, we would, again, going back to the points, that we would allow for residential ground floor heights of at least 15 feet for at least one additional point. Um, right now, the points aren't quite aligning to incentivize a higher ground floor, but it makes a big difference if you have residential and commercial on the ground floor of a neighborhood, that those are all sort of maintaining a higher level. Um, P3, ground floor commercial space, um, we believe that it should apply to sites outside the M overlay where no active use standards exist. Um, 
talking about residential entries that are off of a street. The most successful conditions for the residential entries, right now there's a series of points that talks about how high um, those sort of porches are elevated above the, the public sidewalk, that there's a, some kind of a screen, that there's some kind of landscaping, um, and that the, there's a, enough of a setback to provide a private space. And we think that the most successful conditions for those residential entries are when at least three of those elements are, are present. And I think right now in the points, it just asks for two of them, but we um, suggest that um, requiring three of those points to be met would create the most successful residential ground floor uses. Um, thinking about pedestrian access plazas, when they are deep and covered, they are often too dark and not safe. People don't feel safe around them. And so it's a, our suggestion that they should be um, open so that you're not having a deep canopy over them and making it dark. There are lots of um, uh, notes about weather protection at main entries and minimum requirements and along transit streets. And again, they just really need to align with the guidelines. Minimum coverage should be increased to 30% so that there's enough um, coverage along transit streets. Um, awnings at building entries also really help for wayfinding. Um, and we shouldn't allow any awnings over landscaping or other non-walkable surfaces. Moving on to another tenant, quality and resilience. Um, again, there's always a lot in here. One is about the vertical uh, clearance to pedestrian circulation systems, and here is where we're talking about balconies, uh, bay windows, sky bridges, and uh, currently is shown as nine feet, but we really think that uh, that is too low and should be reconsidered. Um, exterior finished materials for coherence and quality 80% of the cladding should be three of the approved materials. 20% should be limited to one non-approved material, a material that's not on the pre-approved list, not non-approved, but on the list. Um, we should remove the, the text that says per facade so that we ensure that there's design coherency around the entire building instead of just saying on this facade you can have three materials plus one not, not off the list and on the other facade you might interpret that as saying you can have another three materials, uh, which would not help design coherency. Um, it's also recommended to look at another term instead of saying visually match um, to ensure the makeup of the, to ensure the materials actually match instead of just visually because you can say wood and then something that's uh, a wood veneer or a wood laminate, but those are not the same material and may result in something that's not coherent in the design and the facade. Um, the number, oh, again, number of materials should not be limited per facade, but per building. So that's related to the previous um, tenant. Um, related to the building materials and sort of our process, we think that it would be really helpful to have the materials live um, in an administrative rule so that it can be updated more quickly. If it's in the actual code language, it takes a very long time to change that. And material technologies are always um, changing and evolving and some things sort of fall out of favor because over time we find that they don't perform well. New products come online that are um, much more advanced than old products. And so those we would you know, want to be able to add to the approved list and not make sure that people are um, never using them again because they've gotten so much better. Uh, there's a lot of things like that. Metal panel used to have a stigma, I think. It used to not look good. It looked like tin siding. And now there's so many things that are very beautiful made of metal panel. And, you know, in the past, maybe you didn't want a building that was concrete, but there's lots of really beautiful modern concrete buildings. And so, um, putting it in an administrative, so that it can be changed administratively instead of by a code makes a lot of sense because building technology has changed. Um, I know that uh, we also wanted to say that there's some specific things in the different materials that could be considered. Um, for instance, uh, for this list of approved materials, you know, we talk about wood, we talk about concrete, we talk about metal panel, but there are other um, sort of really specific uh, qualities of each of those. So for instance, wood, you don't want it to be on south facing. Um, you want it to be treated properly on all six sides, et cetera, to make sure that it lasts over time and doesn't um, discolor, it doesn't stain, it doesn't fall off. And so um, there's a few 
sort of specifics that we could talk about in there, um, in including minimum thicknesses, including profiles that are appropriate, and asking folks in, when they're using the standards to consider the placement and the exposure to ensure long-term quality. For the metal panels, we suggest clarifying the standards, uh, saying that steel panels uh, up to 12 inches wide of a specific gauge, um, 20 gauge, 18 gauge, would be acceptable. If the gauge is lighter, you're going to 22, they would require um, a rib in the middle, um, a dart that makes them more stiff, even though the material itself is thinner. And then for concrete, we would suggest that, you know, maybe one foot above sidewalk grade, Concrete is fine um, as is, but if it's going to be any taller than that, it should be an architectural finish because that uh, has a lot of effect. The quality of the surface of concrete has a lot of effect on the street. Um, so the letter that we provided last week addresses some but not all of the code amendments, and um, there's lots of them that are really wholeheartedly supported by the Design Commission. We believe that the DOZA has been, that DOZA has strengthened the design review process and reconfirms it as a really important part of planned growth. And Sandra and Laura and Phil have brought intelligent, rational, and balanced thought to the DOZA project. And th your work will be of, you know, value for so many generations to come that it's, it's really important and we really appreciate all of the work that you've been doing on it. Um, we know that um, I, I'm a new design commission member. I joined in, in July, and I know many of you are also new to um, planning and sustainability. So um, absolutely, if you want more information, if it doesn't bore you to tears to hear about um, <laughs> wood profiles and things, we would be happy to talk to you at any time about any questions that you have to clarify any of our comments in the letter. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Chandra. Yeah. Sandra. We, we were already behind, um, so, but I was, I'm thinking there are likely questions that commissioners had. Do you? Oh, Commissioner Robinson? Correct. Um, I think if, I, if we could Im impose on you a little longer, and if there are questions about the purpose map and thresholds, why don't we go ahead and um, yeah, like those questions because that's a good conversation to have. If it's about the standards, as you can see, when we get into the standards and guidelines, it gets really fast into the nitty gritty about, you know, how are these materials treated, et cetera, which is why we have on the agenda um, a call for a potential standards working group. I mean, um, Eli, you had that idea of some of, some of you will want to get into the nitty gritty, and maybe that's an, um, an opportunity also of working with it, some of the design commissioners on those, on those standards before we have the discussion. Okay, so if, if there's clarifying questions that you have of Chandra on her um, testimony regarding purpose, <laughs> purpose map, and thresholds. map and thresholds. <laughs> um, I think that'd be now is the time to offer that opportunity up. No, I got. It. I'll keep it to two. How okay. about that? Um, to the question of. Um, and is, is this tied to the thresholds? Okay. And your, your statement regarding um, um, like the thresholds for large buildings, let's say you feel right. it's too large and should be lowered. If the standards better align with, with the guidelines as per your testimony, mm -hmm. would you feel more comfortable with those thresholds remaining? And I, where a little bit of background on my thought is, I too feel like the standards and the guidelines need to be cut in lockstep. Yeah. And that as a designer that's going through a type three, while I realize I'm going through a type three, I feel like if I should be able to follow those standards mm -hmm. and feel pretty confident, yeah. I'm going to have a successful design review hearing. Right. Um, so I guess, but I understand for that to work, the standards have to kind of meet what you th as design commission would feel is important. So I guess I'm right. curious about your thought on that. I mean, we, we have discussed it a lot, and it's, it's actually, it's a little bit scary to think of a building that's that tall or that's that big that isn't going through another level of design. 
uh, oversight, review, um, a DAR, something that's kind of helping them get there. I absolutely think if the design standards and the guidelines are really well connected, then the chances are very high that someone could produce something that is good. And this is not in the central city. This is, you know, farther out in, in other areas, of course, in central city, they would be going through design review. But I think it absolutely just would, it depends on um, sort of the whole design commission's review of the standards again and, and feeling that confidence. And I think that as a commission and as a group, we would really want to look at that together. But I think that everyone um, is certainly very hopeful that we can, we can get there and that we would feel much more comfortable. Um, but I think that uh, it's just something we would have to look at again as a group. We, we like really looking at the design standards in order to say what like what level of comfort that is. But yes. No, that's fair. I agree that would help a lot. Yeah. And then one other question. Um, this may not hit your three things. They're on the <laughs> slide, which means that's, that's official. <laughs> but I can make it quick. <laughs> to the question of, of height and step backs. Yes. Far height and step backs. Um, I um, I would ask, posit for for thought that you're absolutely right. Design Commission is there to help get a building um, to respond to its context better. Yes. And as you said, FAR is kind of one of those things that people go to buy a piece of property they guarantee. But I would also argue so is height and so is setback. So a thought that I've had, and I'm curious how. You, and Grant Agar, this is you, not the whole commission sure. responding to this, is that yes, you, an applicant has the right to hit a certain height, but design commission has the right to push back a certain percentage mm -hmm. to shape the overall massing so it's perhaps not so bulky. Right. Same thing with setbacks, that perhaps there's 60% of the facade, you know, hits the setback as set by the code, but maybe you get a 10%, design commission has you know, 10% of play to respond to a certain contextual thing or something. I don't, you know, I don't know. I'm, make, I'm obviously making up numbers. Just sure. curious about your thoughts on that well, concept. It's, really, it's interesting. I hadn't thought about it uh, before. I would say that what, what we're trying to do is make sure that all of the buildings that we review are really performing well for the public realm. They're responding to the context. They have really coherent designs. And I think that the more... Um, the more sort of nuance that the, the nuances that we're working with are within those three tenants. And then if we add another one that's really about height or about setbacks, there's so much we could change so much about a building by being able to say, oh, you're gonna have to carve that back 15% more that I think um, there would be, it would take more time because now we're really sculpting a building instead of offering up the rules or the guidelines behind why, if you have this giant site and you have these two towers in this location, why those locations aren't quite right. Maybe both of the towers should be at the back of the site or both of the towers should be at the front of the site. But once we get into the nuance of like really um, scaling back and scooping out just a little bit here and there, I think that puts it makes the process of design review probably much longer. I think that there are a lot of times when we have really good discussions in a design advice request with an applicant and we're talking about how it responds to context and we will offer up those things pretty much exactly saying, yes, you don't have to, but it would really respond to the context much more if the top two floors of your building stepped back just a little bit. But they're within their bounds to create that shape of building that's allowed by, by uh, zoning code. But we work with them to massage it a little bit, but it's still based on their program and it's meeting the guidelines. And so I think we're, we're actually still able to do what you're thinking about but without prescribing how much we're allowed to tell them to move something back. Um, and I think that when we go through the design advice request um, meetings, people are, are really open to that kind of feedback of what's going to respond best to the context. And I think it makes it much more of a, a collaboration instead of um, the design commission sort of dictating that. And, and so that's sort of my personal opinion based on my experience in, in the hearings room and working with applicants is that um, they do want it to be a collaboration and 
um, it is a, it is a hardship sometimes when when if we're if we're giving them direction saying no that that cannot be there and if it's if it's in the code then great there's they just have to do it but if it's something else that I don't know there's a nuance to it I'm not sure if I'm being very articulate about that but I do think that we're we're doing that now um, but we're not prescribing how much we're allowed to sort of push back on that so I, I appreciate you walking us through that yeah um, to the fact that you're doing it now a little bit of um, my concern is that there's um, been stated expectations by individuals in our community that when height and setbacks and far are discretionary, that they have the right to fight the height. Mm -hmm. Yet somebody who's purchased that mm -hmm. property purchased it based on a knowledge that, that they, they could, could have something high. on the 10th yeah. floor. You pick it, right? Whatever right. that height is. Yeah. And they've built their performance around that. Yeah. So. I, I guess I'm trying to figure out how to strike that balance right. of, of all of that. But I definitely appreciate um, your point of view and yeah. for sharing that. Yeah, that's a very good point. I, I totally understand what you're saying. The, the public really wants to be able to comment on that. And uh, they probably come into the hearings room and, and they say, you know, this is too big or it's too tall or, or something. But all of those things are already allowed. And they're not something that we... Um, we're telling them, sure, we'll take a look at it and see if you know we can shave it down for you. I, I, I wouldn't want to open that door. I would want there to be some other way for them to let everyone know that they feel like that, you know, what's allowed by code is inappropriate for their yeah. specific neighbor. And and I would agree. Your the commission makeup today is is very reasonable about working with applicants. Yeah. Um, my concern is other commissions in the future. Yeah. So and just trying to make sure we've kind of got some wheels on on how that all works yeah, good point. that I'll leave it at that okay. if there, there's any other commissioners that have questions no thank you so much thank for uh, taking the time to be with us tonight we really yeah, appreciate pleasure. it look forward to seeing more of you I know we've got a couple more uh, work sessions we're excited about those definitely too. thank you I just have a very pursuit we're going to be getting that uh, letter right and where would we get it would that be sent to us or that's a good question. Yep, it's in the map app. Oh, Ready? it's in the map yep. app. Yep. Okay. It, it's in the map app, and I believe it's uh, the uh, it says it's from Stacy Monroe on behalf of the design commission. Okay. So, excellent. If you see her name, but it says on behalf of the design commission, that's the one. I was just in there today, and it's definitely there. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Well, speaking of testimony, Phil will um, give us a quick summary of a very quick summary, right, Phil? Um, of what's in, what testimony you've seen. Hopefully you've started reading the testimony um, so you can, um, it can inform your discussion today. But we have a slide for you that shows um, the testimony. You can go to the next slide. I don't want to do it quite yet. Okay. I don't want to. Sorry. Oh, you have um, so I, real quick, uh, so our testimony officially closed at 5 p.m. on Friday. Um, we actually had a bit of a miscommunication, and the map app did not actually get closed till um, Sunday. Um, and there was some scrambling happening. I don't know if any of you folks have gone through the map app in the last few days. There was some scrambling being done by some folks uh, t towards the end of Friday. I think they thought that the end was calendar day Friday. And we found a lot of uh, duplicative Somebody, people were hitting enter multiple times because they weren't sure if they were getting their testimony in. Um, so it looked like we had 201 pieces of testimony. Uh, we went through and, and there were some that were literally sent at, at two second intervals, so they, with no changes. So we went through and cleaned that up a little bit. What we ended up with is 165 pieces of distinct testimony. Uh, including there were two that were sim submitted on Sunday, uh, but we're going we're gonna to include those since we we did not close the uh, the map app. Um, we were co uh, coding these kind of to align a little bit with some of the topics that we talked to with with you. If, if you recall, when we were having the hearing uh, testimony about the the M overlay was something that was was coming up quite a bit. But as we went through and the the testimony continued into uh, uh, past the hearing uh, up until the, the the weekend, we started getting a lot more uh, items that were interested in, in what our, we were proposing as our thresholds, um, as well as the guidelines and the standards. So those those were kind of the top pieces there. 
Um, and of course, today we're going to be talking about thresholds um, as one of the items. Um, I don't want to go into as much too much detail about how many were in favor of the thresholds, how many wanted lower, how many wanted higher. Um, we're still sorting through that. Um, we're still kind of looking through all the testimony um, because it would just, did just close a couple days ago. Uh, but I wanted to give a little snapshot of, of kind of the, the key topics that people commented on. And with that, I going to go on to, and was this you? Um, sure, it can be. So unless there's any questions about the testimony itself, we were going to go on right on to our presentation. Okay. Um, so this, I think this slide is just reminding you that we're in volume two, so we'll have some page numbers um, and just to help us get oriented on where you can find the exact proposals. <clears throat> um, so the purpose, um, I know we talked about this um, before diving into the design guidelines last week, um, so I'm just going to recap this very, very quickly. Um, the assessment that we uh, did in 2017 um, was really a recommendation to clarify and revise the purpose statement to meet the goals of the comp plan and to incorporate the three tenants. Um, when we first drafted this purpose statement, we discussed what makes a good purpose statement. And I haven't talked about this um, recently, so I'll just kind of summarize that really quickly. Um, we think that to make a good purpose statement, it needs to be succinct and clear. It should address the what, why, and how. It should align with the city's foundational goals and it should really save the details for the code and the guidelines. <clears throat> so what we landed with is um, the why, which is design overlay zone ensures that Portland is a city designed for people. The design overlay zone supports the city's evolution. Where is within current and emerging centers of civic life. The what is that it promotes design excellence in the built environment. And the how is through the application of these tools um, uh, that, uh, that promote these three tenets. So as I've mentioned many times before, we took um, words directly from our comp plan. Um, and when we had first um, spoke to you in 2017, um, you all had expressed um, concern about keeping bumpers in place so that design overlay isn't necessarily trying to do everything everywhere. Um, and we came up with um, that the design overlay zone purpose statement does not have to restate all of the goals and policies of the comp plan, um, that it should really reflect the goals of chapters three and four um, about the physical design uh, on a building on a site. Um, so just to um, wrap up, I wanted to highlight some of the discussion from last week in case, um, in case you all don't remember. I had um, went through it again. Um, some of the things that you brought up were, you know, how do we decide where the three tenants are important in the city? And for instance, how should this inform the map? And that really um, informed us that we needed to bring to you the purpose statement and the map at the same time. Um, so that's why we're dovetailing the map today. Um, we acknowledged, um, I think, last week that there was an inherent tension between design overlay and the production of housing. Um, so there was a question about, do we need to state that uh, design review um, shouldn't inhibit the production of housing. Does this need to be acknowledged in the purpose statement um, or that it shouldn't create obstacles to the creation of housing? Um, we also um, have talked a lot about state law does this um, by requiring the two-track system um, so that you can go through design standards instead of design review. Um, so does the purpose statement need to add more to that? Um, there was also the point that calling out housing may be too limiting at this moment in time. Um, it's housing today. But then there was the question about industrial lands, jobs, employment. So what is that balance um, of the needs today versus unforeseen needs? There were also some points about naming equity and culturally specific design within the purpose statement um, and about who can afford the space, not just about housing. Um, and then making sure that design overlay is not creating that undue balance of benefits and burdens. Um, there was a comment that there was an appreciation for the focus on people rather than just on the buildings, um, but also wanting to perhaps um, add something about designing for people and the surrounding environment. Um, for instance, designing um, in harmony with nature. Um, in general, there was support for the three tenets in concept. And so, like I said, we discussed the guidelines under, the, um, under those three tenets. Um, but we said we would come back to you so you could deliberate a little bit more wholeheartedly about the purpose statement itself. So I will leave it at that. So thank you. Open it up to discussion. So 
Is there anybody at this point who feels it's necessary to change or modify the purpose statement? Or are we all comfortable with where it's at? I think everyone's comfortable with the purpose statement. I'm not seeing any exceptions. Thank you. Okay. Let's okay. move on. Okay. Sandra is saying move on. Let's go. Okay. <laughs> We're almost Thank back you. on track. Wow. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Sorry, I was a little bit of shock there. <laughs> I'm next. <laughs> so uh, for the map of the D overlay, if you notice uh, on the image there, it shows the pages where we're, we're actually proposing the changes. But just to kind of step back a little bit, remember we, we've we given you guys folk a history of sort of where the D overlay started from starting with the central city and then moving out into various plan areas, Albina, Outer East, uh, and so on. And so this, just wanted to reiterate the area as of now that has the D overlay. Um, most recently, of course, we added the design overlay to many of our centers and corridors and some of our neighborhood and town centers uh, that didn't have it before, including uh, areas like Midway and uh, West Portland, and then also the Belmont Hawthorne Division corridors. Uh, those add-ons were done fairly recently, May of 2018 is when they were effective. Um, we actually haven't seen a lot of projects come in to get a sense of how those Project, uh, you know how those areas are responding to having the D overlay. Um, so, as we were looking through the discussion draft initially about expanding the D overlay, we didn't have a good sense of whether it was ready to expand the D overlay and or um, what kind of outreach we should do with businesses and and, and residents in those areas. Um, and so, as it turned out, what we ended up proposing as you saw in the proposed draft, is actually just to remove the D overlay from the single dwelling zone properties uh, with the exception of to the Twilliger Design District because there's some other history with Twilliger. Um, and so if you at the back of our uh, volume two, there are a collection of maps that show those being removed. Uh, in some cases, it's very few properties. Uh, probably the largest chunk of properties are some R25 properties in the Selwood and Westmoreland area. And uh, those originally were added, had a D overlay added prior to our changing our base zone residential standards. Uh, at the time, we didn't have any limitations on garage frontage. We didn't have any requirements for front door entries and things like that. And when we upped zone from R5 to R25, the sense was um, that that rezoning, possibly the D overlay could be removed once we created some design standards for single family zones. Um, in 1999, we actually created those standards, but we never came back and removed the D overlay from those areas. So our sense is once is that the you know D overlay is not a tool to apply to, to smaller scale residential development. So we are pulling that off the off of those. Um, we did not make any more significant changes on that, uh, but as it is shown in uh, section five of volume one, we do have some plans to, uh, to uh, we have some things we'd like to do in the future to kind of address some of these other neighborhood centers that don't currently have the D overlay. And I'll let uh, Laura talk about that a little bit. So uh, actually, if you don't mind, maybe we should pause there to think about what the proposal is on the table. So the proposal is to remove the D overlay from single dwelling zones as shown in those map, um, maps. Um, so if we could have a discussion about that or see if anybody has an issue with that before we go on to um, Section 5, which is kind of a bigger issue. Great idea, Sandra. Any questions? Concerns? Looks like Chris. So I'm supportive of removing it from the single dwelling zones, but I'm, I think I need to go back to first principles a little bit. So in a prior meeting... I had characterized the design overlay zones as uh, being intended to cover the areas that were going to see the most intense development in Portland. And I got some head shakes that maybe not everybody saw it the same way. So could you refresh us on what's the driving principle for where we're applying this zone? It's, it's changed over time. I think that's the current principle is that you apply it to areas of of anticipated growth uh, and and into some of our centers, 
in the past, it was basically a tool to provide additional standards. Um, you know, certainly changing a zone from R5 to R25 was not necessarily acknowledging that that was going to be an area of significant growth. It was just, at the time, a sense of providing some additional design controls for potential row houses in a zone that previously allowed single dwelling detached. Um, in the East Corridor, there was there was some situations where we upzoned, but we upzoned for residential and applied the D overlay. We're not necessarily touching on that. Um, but I have to admit, I believe you know, the purpose of the design review or the, the application of the design overlay zone has changed over time. But as it is now, we're, we're generally applying it to areas that we anticipate growth. Um, if I could quote from this, um, currently it says that design air overlay zone is applied to areas where design and neighborhood character are of a special concern. So that's actually not the same as, now proposed this is maybe a, a change, but because I, I was curious about this too, how do we decide what areas are de-overlay? And at least under current land zoning code, um, it's not areas where we're expecting more development. It's where design and neighborhood character are of special concern, um, which I think is shaky um, as a basis for designing the overlay, but anyway, that's what I would And that just, I think that helps illustrate that it has changed, because <laughs> that, that you're quoting something that was written, it's in the current code, right? Right. Yeah. And I, b I believe it is. Yeah. So if you look at back at the purpose um, in, on section, uh, on page 13, um, there is a bunch of cross strike through language. And what we discovered during this project, because we had these same questions, why is the D here, not over here? And some of us had some institutional memory of how the D had been expanded and, and the recent expansions and past expansions. So that all that cross out language originally had some of that and then other things kept getting added to it. Transit areas got added to it after the original D overlay. And so I think over the years it has morphed and thus the map has morphed. And so what we try to do with DOZA is think through, well, life is different today. We have a new comprehensive plan. What are we trying to accomplish with this overlay to advance the comprehensive plan? And Laura has taken from the comprehensive plan, redrafted the purpose statement, and then we took a look at the map and the only thing we're proposing with the map is to remove it from the single dwelling zones to comport with the new purpose statement. To piggyback there, though, if I'm reading, I'm on page 15, folks, in 33420021. The design overlay zone is applied to areas outside of centers and corridors that have distinct features with important development context and to specific zones identified through the comprehensive plan. So I'm getting that I can go to the comprehensive plan and pull up some specific zones. How do I? How do we determine what areas have distinct features with important development context? Well, I think that um, this is a little bit of a hybrid. Um, uh -huh. We're acknowledging it's, it's come a long way. Um, so some of the earlier design guidelines are um, on Terwilliger. That's one of the places where we were really wrestling. Are we going to grow a lot on Terwilliger? No, we're not. Um, it has a design overlay. We felt like it was kind of funny to just um, to take that out, and acknowledging that we have Terwilliger is sort of an anomaly. Um, and so we just, we left that in, um, knowing that primarily this is a tool for growth and that's why the, the purpose statement um, is mostly about growth in um, centers or emer emerging centers. Is it just Terwilliger and Markham Hill? And Markham Hill, that's right. Um, and Markham Hill also has its own design guidelines, um, which we also didn't touch because we felt like those were two sort of anomalies that um, didn't really fit in with the rest of you know the comp plan and its new urban design framework. And these are the places that we're growing. Here are two areas that definitely are distinct. They're on hills. Um, they've had a, a history with um, design overlay and they have their own special tools. And so we just kind of, we felt like it was funny to leave that out. Um, it so also probably references how it's been used in the past. So, I mean, you have the Bridgeton neighborhood up up near Hayden Island that has the D overlay that was added as part of the Albina plan. Uh, it's not a center. 
much of the East Corridor area was upzoned, but not necessarily, you know, made a center or, you know, or a major corridor, but it had the D overlay applied as part of that gateway in East Corridor planning in the 90s. So I, I think what it's trying to do is acknowledge in the past that there was areas that the D overlay got added through a planning process where it was considered an area of, at the time we said, you know, areas of special concern is what we had. We mm. And now it says important it. development context. To me, it's just as ambiguous. Mm -hmm. So where I'm, where I'm going with this, I think we, I can cut this at least conversation short for myself, is I get it. I think the commentary helps, but the commentary doesn't fully explain all those parts and pieces that you just did. And just to have a historical record of what in the world we referenced at some point in time when we're looking at this code 10 years down the road, it'd be great to understand the historical context in those particular neighborhoods um, that we feel were as you say, distinct, with distinct features and important context. And, you know, perhaps that allows us to clean it up later and down the road, too. Any other comments, questions, concerns? I think otherwise we're good to move on. Great. Great work. Um, and I don't, we don't need to belabor this next part um, because it is not actually part of the proposal, as Sandra mentioned, but I just wanted to leave space. Um, because it was brought up so much in the testimony. Um, so as Phil mentioned, we had uh, proposed within the discussion draft, so the prior draft, um, the expansion of design overlay to all neighborhood centers. So you can see, um, and for some reason this is really light. Um, so imagine that's the city, <laughs> um, Willamette River, Central City here. Um, everything that is shaded in has the design overlay, and obviously this is conceptual. Um, so. The, this isn't ex actually where it's applied. They're not perfect circles. But where we have the um, empty circles are also neighborhood centers. So they have, they are the same, um, they have the same growth potential as the others of the same size, and they do not have design overlay applied to them. So again, using the lens of the purpose statement, we had sort of wrestled with, well, if we, um, if we have this new purpose statement and we're crafting new tools, um, if the process itself can provide an opportunity for the community to have a voice in shaping um, the development and the buildings that define their piece of Portland, um, does it make sense to apply it to all of these areas that have um, the same? And so that was one of the reasons why we brought it up in the discussion draft. Certainly the low-rise commercial study um, that Commissioner Robinson brought up earlier, um, where we had identified um, areas with similar design features. These are sort of the inner main street corridors. Again, we've had a lot of um, testimony on this. Um, in the mixed use zone project, just for a little background and history, um, BPS staff at that time proposed to down zone um, some of these inner main street areas, uh, 13 of them. Uh, PSC did not support the down zoning. Um, and so um, BPS at the time gave them the main street overlay um, which supports uh, commercial ground floor active uses. Um, and so what happened was eight of those areas retained or received design overlay and five did not. And those five that didn't were the easternmost. So we just started thinking about the new purpose statement with this applied sort of equity lens. Um, does it make sense, uh, again, to leave these out? And then, if, and then we also were thinking about um, Seattle. This is all outlined in, in um, volume one by the way, um, section five. Um, we also were thinking about Seattle. Um, we did some Pierce City research. Um, they have a design review process, um, which is triggered by zone specific thresholds regardless of where you are. And so we, um, so all of this came together and we just proposed this expansion and we just decided to put it out there for the community um, to discuss. Um, it was met with some support, but certainly not everywhere and not overwhelmingly. And in some cases we were told uh, there was not support. Um, specifically in Cully um, and in um, 42nd and Killingsworth. And so we just ultimately decided let's wait until these amendments are in place. Um, we can see what happens. Uh, we have these new tools. We are really pivoting. Um, and so it, maybe it makes sense just to let it all breathe um, and come back later. Um, so that's what we, that's what we have proposed. Um, so we've written a bit about it in Section 5 and Volume 1. And so when you read through the testimony, that's what I, that's what the, that refers to. So we just kind of wanted to give this space in case, in case you wanted to discuss it, but it is not part of our proposal to expand at this time. Any questions? Okay, go ahead. 
Well, I appreciate the chance to talk on this. And maybe if you go back one slide, I was waiting for you to share that. Yeah, I thought that volume one, section five was really intriguing. Um, and I suspect that some neighborhoods that were concerned about being part of it were afraid of design review, maybe not so afraid of design standards. The, the clear and objective part has a lot of, a, I think sometimes people are afraid of discretionary review, but the standards are okay if they do a good job on the standards. And I've thought about this a bit, and thank you, Laura, for sending me the map overlaying the the overlay with the Main Street, the M overlay. Uh, I think that in many ways they feel similar to me. Uh, and we had a lot of testimony getting them confused. Uh, in both cases, you're taking a base zone and you're adding on an additional level of sophistication and design. So M overlay, I looked up, has the maximum building setbacks, location of vehicle areas, ground floor windows, entrances, all those are also covered with points in the design review standards process. I know this is, as you say, probably not part of this project, but I hope that we have standards good enough so that these, we don't need both those zones. We can merge them. M and D, I mean, the, the areas, looking at the overlap, there's some areas that are sort of grandfathered in, they're not really on a strip, like in Hayden Island, they're not on a strip at all. Um, maybe those areas fall out. And there's some areas that are currently Main Street to get the design treatment. And some of the D overlay that really goes into the multifamily, into the neighborhood, maybe that contracts to being a corridor. Um, it feels to me like these design standards work best along corridors. They really focus on centers and corridors, and um, I could see us not needing both those. Um, and that relies on having really good design standards, because I would not suggest that we start doing discretionary review on all this, this stuff. I mean, I would actually suggest maybe we increase the threshold to before it becomes required discretionary review. But I think there would be an elegance, and it would focus really in on, admittedly, my favorite tenant, the public realm, as the thing that we really have to get right in the areas, and also acknowledging that both these codes are things that sometimes get baked into the base code later on. We saw that with the, multi the mixed use project, where now it has some things that used to be you know, scoring ports for design, now you have to do it everywhere. Um, it seems like we have both the design review and the Main Street overlays that both could feed into base code. I think maybe they could be the same thing. I'm going to interject really quick because we looked at the M overlay and I'm going to hope that Phil or Laura or, or Stacy can help me with this. I believe the M overlay has two features to it that aren't about design and the physical aspects. One is the commercial ground floor requirement. So that's a use regulation. The D overlay does not have that. And the second thing that the D ha the M has was, do you have that for Phil? <laughs> Well, there's also there's also some prohibit there's some prohibited uses as well. Um, so there's use regulations with yeah. the D overlay. And there's there's some prohibited development, for example, in the M overlay because it's really written to be on the corridor. You cannot do houses, attached houses, duplexes. So there's certain building types that are not um, that are prohibited in the M overlay that you could potentially do in the D overlay, uh, even on the corridor. Um, there is definitely a lot of overlap between the two. We do have a lot of situations where the M overlay applies and there is no D overlay. Uh, 82nd Avenue is, is one that comes to mind. Um, and then, uh, you know, I, I know there was some testimony about North Portland. We do have a lot of overlap with the M and D overlay along Interstate uh, Avenue as well. And the M was just created in the mixed use zone project, right? Right. And, and once again, the M overlay was there. We used to have. Um, a Main Street node and a Main Street corridor overlay. Uh, they applied to a much smaller area. I think it was just really applying to Lombard, Sandy, and Division. Uh, and so we created this more holistic M overlay that we added to a, a lot of areas. But once again, it's been effective for about 17 months. And so um, oftentimes, especially because there was a lot of permit and land use activity that happened prior to that w that's still getting built, uh, we don't necessarily have a good sense of how it's playing out in practice yet. Any other kind of questions or comments on the map? I, I guess I'm curious about something, Eli, this might be an area you're familiar with because it has to do with Cully. Cully is a pretty sophisticated neighborhood association. They've got a lot of expertise and experience, and they did not want design overlay. And I, I was assuming, and maybe I'm wrong, that they thought the cost would perhaps inhibit new development. And so they, they did, I'm guessing, I'm speculating a little bit, a bit of a cost-benefit analysis. Are we 
is the obstacles this is going to create for new forms of development, new smaller development, not the cost isn't worth the benefit. And so I'm just wondering, as you're, we're applying an equity lens, uh, it, you said something, Eli, well, you think they're scared of discretionary review. I assume they're smart enough to understand also that there's a standards process, and they didn't want that either. So uh, I'm just curious what, if Cully doesn't want it, are there some other neighborhoods that have it and perhaps don't realize the negative impacts in a smaller commercial area of having design overlay? Well, I haven't posed the question, although I know who to ask it to, to see if that, what their response was out of concern. Um, but I think the cost, I mean, we talked a while ago on the PSC about bringing a, a lens to our projects, and one of them is the cost lens. And we read in our testimony a long letter from, from you know, from Walsh Construction talking about cost impacts of these, some things that would come up in, even in the standards, independent of the guidelines, which would have, sorry, come up in the standards independent of the design review process, which adds more of the cost of risks and time of project. And so, I mean, I would be interested getting a little bit of a cost impact analysis of this um, in the project. But I, I guess I, um, yeah, I guess I was speaking for, um, as, the, as a developer, I think that the design review carries more risk and project cost to it, um, whereas the standards, if well done, might might not cost much more cost. But they would cost more cost. So I think think that quantifying that would be helpful. I, so, uh, do you mind if I jump in? Okay. Kat? Yeah. So uh, I had a conversation with uh, Aaron Riddle, who is. Uh, with the Cully Boulevard Alliance and submitted testimony because uh, I had a similar question to you, Jeff, uh, both because my organization, Verde, operates in the Cully neighborhood uh, and was curious to learn a little bit more about the concerns. And a few things came up. One is I think you're accurate. That cost piece is a concern, especially in a neighborhood that needs a housing that is affordable, not necessarily just regulated affordable housing, but uh, multifamily housing that um, is affordable to people who live in the neighborhood, regulated or not. The other issue that comes up a lot is uh, Cully lacks a lot of basic infrastructure. Um, we don't have a lot of sidewalks in many parts of the neighborhood. Uh, Cully Boulevard has a lot of storefronts that are empty right now and would be spaces that would be difficult to develop. So there are some specific concerns about Cully. But I think those may come up in other neighborhoods as well, is, is there the right infrastructure to actually create opportunities to interact with the public realm? Do you have the right amount of sidewalk space or development? And then if you're trying to uh, fill storefronts and uh, have culturally specific businesses, which is happening in the Cully neighborhood, would design review or kind of building a new uh, building on that space preclude someone from continuing to occupy that property or having a culturally specific business? So that's an issue that comes up as well, kind of to your point about the cost pieces. I think that is, is a, a concern that came up. I, I was just gonna add, there is no doubt because I go through design review all the time, that it's an extremely stressful process. Whether it be lenders who are trying to understand, you know, their national lenders trying to understand what's this process in Portland? What does it mean? I don't know that I want to give you money quite yet because you have this discretionary process to go through that is hard to understand. It's, I mean, because it's discretionary, right? Um, so it's it's that it's the amount of work that a project has to progress through um, before it actually gets approval at design review. Which you know there are improvements that um, we've been putting forth, or that the team has put forth to make those changes. But it's still very stressful. Um, there's a lot of time and money invested, and you kind of float around in this design process of being unsure about whether you can get your project to move forward. And then when you kind of get there and it's all said and done, because you, you, what starts happening is you start scrambling as a designer and a development team and a contractor to problem solve in real time to, to get through design review. So to the cost point, what starts happening is, so things like they're asking you to set back, they're asking you to do this, you're designing, you're quickly trying to get an understanding of what cost just got added and get through a design review process in a set amount of time. And it's sometimes just not doable to stay on construction budget in that amount of time because you just got to get through the process. So, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's really a complicated process. This isn't a comment to say whether it's good or bad. It's just it is a – it's hard. 
there's no doubt about it. As as collaborative and, and great as the design commission is, it's a very stressful process to be on the applicant side. I would just add that, and this is someone with Cat's firm, great expertise, large projects, large budgets, boil that down to a smaller storefront project that you know, it will be ruined if they have to do an extra design review hearing. I mean, the cost of one more hearing could be enough to kill a smaller project. So I think we have to be, I'm not sure what the end result of this is. I know there were some discussions buried somewhere in all that, that, that you gave us that thought design review worked better in the central city and began to question sort of its efficiency outside the central city. Well, I think it's also why I was positing if the standards and the guidelines were really well intertwined, and, and again, I think to make that happen, we would have to really integrate a lot of what Design Commission perhaps um, provided as testimony back to us on standards. But, you know, it, would, it might take that uncertainty a lot more out of the, the design review, the discretionary process, the type three process. If you kind of knew the standards are really, like if I was to follow these standards, I should be able to get through a type three design review with perhaps some minor exceptions to something unique about the site, right? It, and if we could really achieve that goal, I think it starts to, whether it be for lenders, whether it be for builders, you know, you can always just choose, I'm gonna kinda stick to this path versus I'm gonna try to be creative, think out of side of the box and work with design commission on what that means because I didn't hit all these standards, but they might go, oh my gosh, that's a great new material we don't have on the list. Absolutely, we're gonna, you know, so there's, it gives that opportunity for that creativity to still happen while giving a lot more certainty to the discretionary side. So that would be my ultimate goal. I mean, one thing to get at Eli's point um, regarding the standards and, you know, well, if the standards are clear and you can meet them, you know, I don't see a big cost. The thing I, I notice when talking with people on the counter, though, is it's, it's kind of like the long lines, like if you were having to fill in to renew your driver's license and four years ago, it asked you four questions and you were able to do that and sign your name and get your new driver's license the next time you come in and they say, well, there's these four questions and, and also here's a table you need to fill out to show that all these other things, all of a sudden, you know, it adds, it, it adds sort of this, um, you know, extra work you may have to do. You may suddenly go, wow, I didn't realize that I had to come in and show you my birth certificate now to get this. I didn't know that I had to show, you know, repaint my car in order to get that. So even though there's standards, uh, the pushback we sometimes get is, is the, the fact that it just added, added items they have to check off bef before they uh, can get their permit. Oh, they absolutely are. Um, you know, there's one other point to the cost kind of benefit analysis. Honestly, I think we have much bigger cost items that we've put through in recent code changes than the design review piece. So, um, and not to say that the cost benefit analysis isn't important, um, but we've done a lot of other, I'd say great things, but that are causing a lot of consternation and concern. And, you know, we, we could all list a number of them, but that are now in our new code. Uh, I have a question for folks who've gone through design review. Uh, for like a building that you go through design review with versus one that would be very comparable in a space where you don't have to do that, what is the difference in terms of your process or results or like how does that affect uh, the, the process of developing that building? The design review process itself? I'm sorry, ask me one more time. Yeah, I'm, sorry, maybe I'm not asking this question way. right, because um, this is an arena in which I don't have a lot of experience. But just thinking about it, if you are building a building in a design review area versus if you were building that building in an area, an exact same building without design review, how would it affect your process in terms of your thinking or in terms of some of the scrambling that you would have to do? Or like where does design review provide some benefits to you in that development process? And where does it maybe present some challenges where you might choose to develop in an area without the D overlay, if that was an option. Excellent question. Excellent you want to jump in there? Sure. Um, I would say from a design team standpoint, it's, it's a different ballpark uh, in terms of the time that you allocate to that. So it, there's, there's a design review factor that you have to fa factor in, in terms of both time and fee. Uh, which also goes to affect the overall the overall fee for the developer. So um, I would say overall there is a 
fairly significant impact. And um, from a design standpoint, the building, so the end results may not necessarily be completely different. You just know that you have to go through a very set process. So um, having a standard system that is the system that is really coupled in with the design guidelines and a less discretionary um, system, I think, could actually be very beneficial to offset this. I agree. So um, there's there's two ways I'm thinking of your question, Oriana. And one is the actual manpower part of the process. And Ben's absolutely correct. When we're going through design review, once we start that process, we I'm, we have two teams running. We have one dealing with design review. And teams could be one or two people, so don't get me too wrong here. It's not like a ton of people. But we have another working on the actual documentation to get a building done built. So it's added a couple of full-time people to a process for, I'm going to say, three months. So there's that piece of it that you can imagine these two teams are running, doing the same project in parallel. And at the same time, this group is changing things that this group now has to totally change course. So part of the stress part of it. Um, so does it make the building better, though, through the process? Um, I've been kind of curious about that myself. Do, yes, I, w I mean, I sat on design commission. Do I believe that, that the, part, the time I spent on it brought value? Absolutely. At the same time, I'd be really curious... Um, to um, almost see a before and after for a, and, and Design Commission certainly does this um, in front of the council, so you can see kind of the difference they've made, and there's some projects that have been huge, so the fact that they were a part of it was, I think, a game changer for our community, but is that 10%, 5%, 80% of the projects that have kind of swung that pendulum? I don't know. I, I don't know that I have a real good gut feel for how to answer that question. I would say our standards prior to this were really old, really out of date, and they were horrible, um, which is why you saw a lot of people choose to go through design review anyway, because it's like, those are just bad standards. So with this upgrade in standards, which is so exciting to see, you know, does it, like, again, get us to the point where you can maybe argue on the thresholds? I, I would hope so. Yeah, Eli. You brought up funding earlier, and I think there's a, um, some some important ramifications on that. And uh, in the, I think you were referring primarily to private development for uh, um, market market rate development. But in the affordable housing, in particular, typically funding sources are put together from different different sources. You're probably very familiar with that system, and they could be a whole number of different funding sources that are really tied to certain timelines. So having the extra uncertainty of when you actually get to uh, a product where you can actually apply for funding is, is often a real big concern, and I've seen projects go away for that specific reason. How do we do? Kind of answer some questions there. <laughs> And raised a few more, uh, <laughs> but I think that was helpful. The, the next question I've asked, if I may, um, is uh, I was doing some research on other cities with design review, and I know that Denver only applies design review to, like, the first 45 feet of building. Mm -hmm. And I can see some reasons to have it apply to the whole building, especially around something like bird-safe glazing for windows or something where, like, you kind of have to get at 
other other parts of the building, but also wonder how would it affect the design review process if that threshold was limited to that kind of public realm conversation or where it feels like we have a lot of resonance in this space to see really good good design. How would that affect your, your processes if design review applied to part of a building, but not all of the building? Does it make it more complicated or does it potentially reduce some of the, the scrambling that has to happen? I would say no doubt it would reduce the stress and the scrambling. Um, does it necessarily get at every, all that design review can get at today? Um, and when I, so to my question with Chandra about height and how, if you think about our blocks, a 200 by 200 block, I take my FIR and I just, whoosh, right? Um, do we want our city to look like that or not? You know, I think that's a, a question back to the community. So right now, Design Commission kind of has some parameters for, um, well, you know, this is right next to a view corridor. It'd be nice if you kind of respected that a little bit more. Uh, but again, that creates a ton of tension and stress, and um, so it's, it's an excellent question. Um, I'm not, I'll, I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> you can add something. And I'll like share, <laughs> um, because some of the commissioners weren't here when we were doing the assessment. The assessment report, the final assessment report, I think is well, very worth um, reading because we did take a look, and there's an appendix that's about this big, and if Arkasha were here, she would say she was carrying it around for a while because she was looking at all those pictures. So we, um, our consultants took a look at projects that went through type three, went through type two, went through community design standards, and did not go through anything, compared them to try to come up with some conclusions and what are the findings, and that's where the finding that Jeff was talking about. But in Central City, Seems like it's really doing a good job. And outside Central City, it's a mixed bag. And sometimes you have projects that are not in design review um, and didn't go through these extra standards that are st still very well designed buildings. And then some of the ones that went through standards are not so uh, not so great. So there's a lot of um, converse, um, discussion in that assessment about that, about the height. We took a look and we had um, we did look at Denver. And we discussed on whether this design review should only apply to the lower 60 feet or something of buildings, and we discarded that for a variety of reasons. Um, so I wanted to share that with you. The other thing um, that I heard going around is the cost of design review. We can come back in our next work session and share some, some examples of costs so that you have a better idea for that. Um, so um, if that's helpful to all of you for this conversation. Um, and the last thing I wanted to share was um, when you're considering, because we're going to move al us along to thresholds, when you're considering um, what the thresholds are, don't forget the design review. Well, our, our philosophy was that the community, the, what are they called now? The design standards, the new design standards we're proposing, and a type two and a type three would result in the same outcomes, equally excellent design, no matter which system you're going through. So as you're thinking about that, that, that's our philosophy and that's our hope. Um, there's a lot of debate, I think, on whether that could actually happen, especially in, for the context um, goal that we all have and we're trying to forward. The other thing that type three and type th two afford is public, a public conversation because a public notice is sent to community members and they can comment on a type two to staff. And a type three, of course, there's a hearing before the design commission. The standards tract doesn't offer that opportunity. You come into the counter downstairs and it's a check sheet by a planner, no public notice and no public comment. So keep those in mind as we're talking about the thresholds and with that, if it's okay, we'll move it along. And I think, is Phil, Phil, are you walking us through the thresholds? So I wanted to, once again, step back a little bit and those of you who remember the, the assessment, um, there was several goals that the assessment was uh, shooting for in their suggestions for the changes to the, the thresholds uh, for going through design review and or meeting standards. Um, and I just want to go over some of these. Once again, the idea was better aligning the, the level of the review uh, with the impact of the proposal and to kind of have that level have a you know a larger review for a large scale project, and potentially you know 
step back a little bit from having review or having you know uh, uh, burdens on smaller scale alterations or or additions. Um, one of the things they also mentioned, which we are proposing, is that if they, somebody's going through discretionary review, that we have we have a two tier system, uh, one set of uh, review thresholds for Central City and another for outside Central City, and then uh, one of their suggestions was to allow gateway projects to potentially have the opportunity to go use standards, which they can't currently do. Um, so you've seen this uh, this table before. Um, this is kind of just to re reiterate, you know, when we talk about thresholds, we're really talking about three steps. We're talking about is something exempt or not exempt from the chapter entirely, um, at least outside of Central City, which is what we're going to focus on right now, whether a project can go through and meet these additional standards or go through the discretionary review. And then thirdly, if they are going through the discretionary review, um, what type of land use review it is is it that they're going to go through? Uh, we've added right now design reviews are either a type two or a type three. Uh, one of our proposals is to add a smaller type one review. Uh, it's, it's also a staff level discretionary review. It has a shorter time frame and, and no appeal period. But each one of these sections we have, we have proposed changes uh, to an, and uh, we're actually going to kind of flip it a little bit. Oftentimes we talk about the exemptions first and then go through that. But um, we've got an example we want to kind of show to kind of illustrate how this would work in practice. And so we're going to kind of start talking about standards and review, like what kind of project outside the central city could qualify for standards and what kind of project could qualify or would trigger a review. So if you want to follow along in the volume two, our, our, threshold, our thresholds for when something can go through a plan check or not is pages 31 through 33. Um, and a couple things I just want to mention, I, I think uh, we heard from the Design Commission, uh, we did up the, uh, um, the allowance for how large of a commercial only building can use the standards from what is currently in there. And then also for um, buildings and gateway, we do provide an opportunity for them to use standards. Um, and then if you want to go about 100 pages further, back to pages 131 through 135, that is where we have the tables for the different types of review and what, how they get triggered. So we did, uh, with the consultant, with DECA, we worked on uh, several actual building proposals that had gone through and had them relook at our standards and guidelines and see how, how these buildings could go through and meet the standards and guidelines. And so we're using one of their examples uh, to kind of point out how this how this would work. So this is this was a project on Division and Thirty Seventh. It doesn't actually look like this, but this was what uh, our consultant worked at, uh, as a way to try to meet the standards. But to give you some context, this the site's about sixteen thousand square feet. As you can see, it's about a four-story building, so it worked out to be about fifty-four thousand square feet of floor area for the building, and uh, it's about forty-nine feet tall. So. If this was a mixed residential building or a mixed use building with some residential in it, um, it would meet the requirement to be under 55 feet tall. They could choose to go ahead and try to meet the additional standards. If this was a, an, an office building or only had you know, office and, and retail in it and did not have any residential, uh, as you can see that the proposed building was 54,000 square feet, it would be over the 40,000 square foot limit. So, this is kind of shows you that if you were going to do a mixed use, mixed residential building, you could potentially use the standards. If uh, you were proposing an office building, you'd actually have to go through a design review. And we'll kind of go through what that kind of design review that would, that would be. Um, in order for an office building. Bill, can you just explain that? What's the logic there? Um, part, of it, part of it is because state law requires residential projects uh, that are providing housing, needed housing to um, to have a two-track system. We have to provide a two-track system. And so it, we did, don't feel comfortable. We would probably have to do a whole new build, buildable lands analysis if we had some sort of a square footage threshold for a residential project that would force it through design review. So that was that, was that piece. The commercial buildings have always had that 20,000 square foot threshold and we feel confident enough in our new standards 
to bump that upper threshold up to 40,000 square feet. But it still can, in a, an example like this, it still can create a discrepancy between if something was a residential, had a residential component or not. Yeah. Is that right, Kat? Uh, um, is this, does that relate to one of the, uh, one of the testimonies re related to statewide goal number 10? Is that related? I think in that, well, that specific testimony was basically just telling us to make sure we make findings against statewide goal 10 as we move forward on the process. <laughs> uh, well, it is, a, it is, a, it is the, the statewide goal for housing. So basically, as we go through this process and as we create an ordinance uh, and have the city council adopt the ordinance, we will have to make findings against all of the statewide goals, which I think, I don't know, there's 16 or 19. As you, 19 yeah, the higher up you go, you start getting into ones that are talk about coastal, uh, coastal development, things that we don't necessarily uh, have to concern ourselves with. Um, but we have, to, we have to make findings against the statewide goals, against the metro, uh, goals and as, as well as the comprehensive plan goals. So we end up having a big findings report. So just to kind of, uh, oh, did you have a question? Yeah. I mean, I, I think I'm, I'm glad that that's been highlighted because Oregon is, I think, unique in the United States for requiring cities to inventory their housing needs and zoning for it, and can only count it if there's a clear and objective way of actually creating that housing, because people know that if things have to go through the discretionary process, it might not happen. So I have some anxiety about, I mean, I think that even though I know there's some exceptions in state law um, that allow us to put a cap at saying beyond 55 feet or 20 feet or 60 feet, you no longer have the clear and objective option. I, I have some concerns of that, how that aligns with the intent of the state goal which is to say, if you need the housing, if that's part of your housing need, you gotta be able to create it. And that means having a clear and objective path to do so. So I think there is a relationship between that and this threshold. It's because you, as proposed right now, you can go up to a certain height and then you lose the clear and objective option everywhere the D overlay applies. Um, so I think it's just for us to think about that. So did you wanna run us through everything? Sorry. Did you wanna run us through everything or do you wanna go back a step and then we can talk about um, imagining that's a um, mixed-use building with residential on top and have a discussion about that before we move on. It might be good to just go through the scenarios because uh, then it may answer some questions. It probably will cause some additional questions, but then I, then I think we can have a more holistic discussion about how the standards and, guide, and the th uh, review thresholds relate. So the takeaway from the last slide was that, that a building like that that has apartments above and ground floor retail, n n that meets the thresholds for going through the standards tract because it has residential units. Right. But for commercial, which is your next slide, right? Well, so I, if this was an office, and, and in reality, this was a, an apartment building with some ground floor retail, but uh, if this was an office-only building, it would be too large to use the standards, and so it would go through discretionary view. Uh, for a, a commercial-only building to actually potentially go through the standards, and this is an estimation, I'm not sure exactly if it would quite work, but essentially you would not have to knock off a floor, which would probably make it around 39, 40,000 square feet. So it would be under that amount. Of course, it would also still be under the 55 feet tall. So um, that just kind of gives you a sense of, of um, what could happen if somebody's proposing a commercial-only development. Um, and along our corridors, as, as we've seen, most of you know, the vast majority of our development has been mixed use with the residential component. Uh, but this would be the case if it was uh, office only. Um, going the other direction, um, whoops. That's what I get for doing this bar. Um, as, as I mentioned initially, the building was about 49 feet tall uh, for it um, as a four story building. If they were say to propose a fifth story there, uh, that would most likely exceed that height standard that, that Eli's mentioning, uh, and they would have to go through a design review. Um, and that design review, that would apply whether it was commercial only or residential, um, mixed residential. Um, but if you look at the tables in 33825, this uh, would be 
under the 65 feet height limit, most likely. It'd be probably around 60 feet tall at that, at five stories. And uh, we're estimating it would be probably about 68,000 square feet, which would be under the 80,000 square foot threshold that would trigger a type three. So that just give you a sense of, of, of you know, the type of building on this lot that, that would trigger the type two. Uh, you would have to essentially go up to a, a sixth floor uh, to get to the point where within our table you would hit a type three review that would be uh, in front of the design commission and, and with a public hearing. Uh, and it would most likely be over the 65 foot height limit. Um, and it's r probably would be right around the 80,000 square foot limit as well. But if it hits, goes over one of those, it would end up being a type three. I do want to note that on division, most of our zoning there is CM2, which probably wouldn't allow a building this tall anyways. Um, so it's, it's kind of a hypothetical situation, but in areas that we have a CM3 zone where you could potentially go up to 75 feet, this, this is something that's quite possible. Um, I also want to note, because this, these perspectives make this building look pretty massive, but once again, because it's only on a, a, a about a 15,000 square foot um, site, it's actually not a real large site. And I just wanted to show another example on division uh, of a smaller building in height that potentially would trigger a type three review. So if you go down the street to division and 50th, this is a, a project that was completed a couple of years ago. Uh, but because this site is about 30,000 square feet, uh, even though it's a four story building it, and would be under the 55 foot height limit, the options for this building would be to potentially either use the, community, the, the additional design standards uh, but if it decided to go through a design review, because at least according to the tax records, it's about 96,000 square feet total, it would trigger a type three design review. So it's not always about how tall the building is that could trigger the, the design review uh, in front of the design commission. It could be, in this case, it was a, a larger lot and they essentially covered a four foot building on a, or four story building on a larger lot. Uh, and if they weren't able to, either if they just elected not to go through and meet those additional standards or they weren't able to meet the standards, this would be a type three review. So I think I'm gonna stop right there. Um, since this is kind of talking about the standards and the review thresholds and, and see what, uh, if there anybody has any questions or open it up for discussion. Anybody? Yeah. Anybody got questions, comments? I have to say, I find your first example bothersome that I could have a commercial building look exactly the same as that residential building and have to go through a type three review even though it looks so different. I mean, I was in my mind like, well, there's no reason that couldn't be an office building mm -hmm. above retail and it's the exact same building. So that seems, something doesn't seem quite right there. Like, so for whatever that's worth, I don't have an answer to that question quite yet except that seems strange and like we don't quite have things aligned correctly and where I would almost go with that is obviously if we're not going to change the residential and make it go through design review but perhaps the commercial shouldn't in that case and and align those two thresholds but I don't know I, I have, can't say my mind's made up any other comments Eli um, are there situations where some a developer who's using an affordable housing bonus in a CM2 zone would have to be sort of balancing, oh, do I take the affordable housing bonus or avoid it and not have to go through the design review? I think with the or the, or the first floor height bonuses, yeah. the things that are in the base zones right now. So, and one of the things, then one of the things we do actually have to clarify with our piece is that sort of the extensions into the height and or the the first floor bonus about having the higher first floor which is in the base zone, allows you to have a higher height limit along with the other kind of extensions like having railings on the roof and things. We need to be clear that, you know, if you're at 55 feet but you added a railing to the roof and went up to 58 feet, we don't necessarily want that to trigger, you know, require design review because of that. So we have to ensure that the things that are allowed in the base zone that bump up the height also apply to that 55 foot threshold as well. Um, but as far as the other piece, the inclusionary housing, generally in the CM2 zones, as an example, um, they only get a height bonus if they have the D overlay, which 
would be the case in, in these situations, but they get a 10 foot height bonus. So they get to go from 45 to 55. So the, the intent is to line that up. Go ahead, Mike. I'll just say I've had the same gut reaction that you expressed. Any other comments or questions? And I, I, I did, I mean, I guess my other gut reaction is, I hope this doesn't limit development. Like, it, to the point, I think that Eli's picking up, like, I hope that somebody doesn't build less housing just to stay underneath that threshold, right? So, and again, I... And that's definitely our hope, too, but we think we also crafted the standards, so they work really well for a smaller, shorter building. With, do you think that's... That's probably fair, right? Yeah. And so the FAR mm -hmm. allows you to do a tall, thin one, but if it's a tall, thin one we, uh, building, then our position, our proposal is, that has a larger impact that probably should go through design review, but you can uh, achieve the same amount of FAR, number of units, bonuses, et cetera, doing a shorter building, and the standards will deliver the same quality. So I think that's the, that's the difference here. Yeah, and I would say, you know, to that as we were, looking at all those zones and, and the rezoning of all that, there was a lot of community concern about that. And so balancing the D overlay with all of their concerns and getting all that extra height and FAR is, I guess I'll just say it again, balance, yeah, it's just, it's a balancing piece, right? That I kind of feel like there was, we, we had an, a, perhaps an unspoken agreement with the neighborhoods about as we're expanding and putting this density in the corridors and the centers that you're gonna have more opportunities for input. So, so also something to think about. Go ahead, Eli. If I'm thinking through amendment ideas, one, one that comes to mind is that if we increase the threshold at which compulsory design review applied, then I would be okay with having an alternative threshold based on the length of the building's facade. Um, so for example, if it's 55 feet right now, maybe the 55 feet would apply to buildings 150 feet or longer, but smaller buildings could go higher before design review would apply. Because I think that the length of buildings is a big impact on the public realm. Um, and so the, I, I guess I'm thinking maybe a compromising thing there where we increase the threshold um, unless the building's really long and then keep it where it is. And by long, you mean there's more frontage along the public right of way? Correct. The yeah, street. the, the not, longest street facing good. facade, or I'm not sure how you do have to be defined, but mm -hmm. um, I think that in terms of, uh, is it like on this street right here, I mean, that, it, I, I like, and I think that a lot of our old main streets there is, there's an incentive to doing sort of relatively narrow buildings. And even if one building is really blase, the next one might be different. You know, it, it changes as you go down the street. Um, whereas if you have a building that fills up a whole street block, then I could see, yeah, maybe we need to have a little more attention so we don't have like a whole dead street face. Yeah, ben. I think that's an interesting idea. I mean, <clears throat> I think the principle here is that the <clears throat> level of review goes up and it's commensurate to the impact of the building. So in this case, we're measuring the impact in terms of height, but the point that you bring up is, you know, about length of the building is, is equally, equally makes sense. So I think that's something that we could think about. So do you want us to think about that and come back to you or someone have an idea already? Um, we had talked about that and we landed on a combination of square footage and height. Um, so, so I like that square footage combination in the mm -hmm. whatever page 130 something section mm -hmm. um, between type two and type three. I think it captures it there. I'm thinking of something that might be similar to that on the page 31 portion, mm -hmm. where it's like, where do, where do you get to design review versus clear and objective? In any of these buildings over, are, I mean, and there will be a design standards have to work either way, because a lot of buildings will fall under design standards anyway. I'm, just, I'm trying to think of a way to increase the threshold before you hit compulsory design review, and maybe a compromise is to say the threshold is you can go higher um, as an alternate to, um, or you could hit that threshold with the same old 55 foot height for a really long building. But using that um, frontage on the street facing facade as a threshold for kicking you into design review. An alternate trigger. District, not right. between the type two and type three. Right, because I think in the type two and type three, you've already got it in that section. Not exactly, but you've got the floor area piece. Right, we have the floor area piece. Right, I'm yeah. thinking, yeah. So I, I guess I don't have a, um, 
when we get to like the amendment process, I could help brainstorm something, but I don't, I'm not asking for anything back from staff. I'm going to put a placeholder in your amendments because I do want to start creating our amendment list. So sure. when we meet with a three by three with design commission, um, they know what things are moving and which, which aren't. So we'll put a placeholder for this item. If you have other good ideas, let us know. Bill. As, as you were going through some of your examples, um, you made some great comments about different zones that these types of situations can occur in or would occur in. Do you have a feel for the percentage, like where this threshold's at, like kind of the percentage, the percentage of area in the city with the D overlay that we're talking about, you know, as we're starting to look at this threshold? Does that make sense, what I'm trying to get at? I'm like, <clears throat> if... What it, percentage of the city has the D? No, it's not for what percentage has a D, but we're looking at the D and we're in the CM2 and we only have a height limit of this anyway, and therefore with this threshold, we're kind of now out of it, so. Are you wondering, um, if you go back, can you go back to the slide with the, just the one right before it? Like for this one, because it says zoning on division wouldn't allow this. Um, so are you sort of teasing out where, outside yeah. of the central city, would we see this situation where height um, over 65 feet would occur, thus triggering yep. type three? Yep. Okay. We. Well, I can give you, yeah, I, I can't give you numbers, but I can give you zones. So Yeah, I guess I'm trying to. So the CM3, yeah, the CM3 zone, the CM3 it, zone, which of course is applying in, you know, some areas of interstate, some areas on Sandy, some of the outside of Central City. Um, there is also both the RM3 and the RM4 zones, if they get adopted by city council, which are the new uh, multi-dwelling zones, the more intense multi-dwelling zones. Um, yeah, the thing with the RM3 is it has the height provision. It may not necessarily have the floor area allowance that would, other than maybe as a pin. Kind of so build. I'm going to stop you and ask you to come back yeah. with like a memo on that. Okay. And again, I'm just trying to tease out, have we just taken a certain percentage of the city off the table for discussion with this threshold or not, or... And maybe I'm overthinking this, but I'm just kind of curious. Um, I'm not saying very well what I'm getting at, but it seems like you're nodding, like you, I understand. you might understand where I'm going. Probably a map and probably some numbers. Yeah, yeah that's kind of what I'm thinking. Thank you. I have you. the acreage numbers, but I don't think that helps us because it's um, because it's the properties that probably we're interested in. Yeah, I mean, I'm like, if we're having angst over this or something like this, it's like maybe we shouldn't be having angst over it because yeah. it's like. Small part of the city. Right. Yeah, exactly. That's what I'm trying to figure out. Okay. Got it. Okay. So we on to types of review then? Or? Well, this was combining standards oh, we did and both. types of review, right? Because we kind of were showing, well, if it doesn't go cool. through standards in some cases. So that means we're just on to exemptions? Or we've done that too? No, the hope is I do have a slide for exemptions. <laughs> okay. <laughs> And then, we're, and then we're going back to Central City, because just to reiterate, this was for areas outside of Central City, these different thresholds. Okay. So <clears throat> one of the things, and we don't necessarily have a nice set of examples or anything here on this, but uh, if you go to pages 17 to 21, um, those are our list of exemptions. Uh, it, it was a balancing act that we were trying to do. Right now we have about 29 exemptions. We were trying to, to reduce those and potentially make them a little more holistic. Um, but we also uh, you know, recognize that some of those exemptions were, were for specific situations that we, we still wanted to cover. Uh, and so it's kind of a combination of those. But I do want to mention a couple other things. Um, that are definitely different between what's currently in the code and what we're proposing is this idea that um, any kind of development that's involving up to four dwelling units on a site would be exempt. Uh, and that would mean, you know, a duplex, it would mean four little cottages on a, on a property. Uh, it also means if somebody was building an accessory building, a shed, on a site with a triplex that that would be exempt because it's basically any any kind of development or alteration on the site uh, that has up to four dwelling units. 
the other thing I wanted to point out, and I think it was uh, brought up during the testimony from the Design Commission, um, was this idea that we do, uh, we were exempting a, a list of facade alterations that were fairly specific, and then we had another sort of blanket facade alteration of up to 200 square feet uh, of the facade outside of the central city uh, could be exempt. Um, and essentially the idea was to maybe allow some flexibility for those smaller scale storefront remodels uh, that maybe don't, and the intent initially was to, maybe it doesn't meet one of these other, you know, moving of the mullions or, 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 or items with a louver, but it's potentially still a smaller scale. Um, we welcome having some discussions on that. I know we've had some internal discussions with BDS about how those exemptions work together. Uh, but those are sort of the main differences between the current exemptions and what we're proposing. Um, there's some other minor things with how we treat non-conforming upgrades and so on, but I'll, I'll leave it at that. Questions? Comments? I have, oh, go ahead, Eli. Um, I've sent some detailed comments on this already that I think they're too detailed for this chat, but on this, the letter, the testimony from Design Commission, it seems like we have a trick for that. The, the concern about serial changes, um, we could just say you could use the, the 200 square foot exemption only once every some number of years would probably address the concern they raised um, about someone just keep changing a little bit over time. I also have some minor changes which I'll send along to you or suggestions or clarifications. But on the 200 square feet, I do have a question on, did we really mean square feet and not lineal feet? Yeah, so it was, if we go back to, let's take a, like on something like this, I don't know if you can see my mouse, but it was the idea of 200 square feet. So let's say, let's just assume this is about 10 feet tall. If they wanted to sort of change the layout of this area here, they could do a 10 by 20 area of the facade. So not 200 lineal feet would essentially mean you could change the whole no, store fr uh, the whole I, store um, I, I street frontage, um, which gets at some of the central city comments about alterations. But I am um, so I may have some thoughts on a different way to instead of square feet to think about lineal feet um, and. I, there's another piece of our code that I'd like to, that we've got written as square feet um, that probably should be lineal feet that I'll send along. It's a different project for you guys. Um, but it, it's it's kind of tying these concepts together that I, and again, where I'm going with it, to me, it's more about if I'm changing out the storefront, it's, the, it's how long I'm changing it. If I've got a small 10 foot portion, are we, but it happens to be really tall because that's just naturally how the ground floor is. I'm not convinced necessarily that that's what it's about. It's more about how much of the length. And you're right, then 200 wouldn't be correct. Well, I'm and I, I do want to mention this, that wasn't intended to just be a ground floor slash storefront change. Okay. I, if, they, if they wanted to make changes to, you know, the area around the parapet here, if it was, you know, under 200 square feet of the facade, that would potentially be an exemption. Okay, I'll, I'll think about that some more. Go ahead, Jeff. A question, because just reading through the exemptions, the 200 foot facade exemption, it says it doesn't apply in Central City. So if you're doing a storefront TI renovation, you know, moving some glass or the door, you don't get an exemption. This you you would have to meet one of the there's there's six along six total for the facade so you'd have to see if it would meet one through five, so there is a thing about sort of moving storefront glazing within an existing storefront moving kind of the mullions in the door uh, that they could potentially fall under but it wouldn't the blanket two hundred square foot exemption was just outside Central City. I guess one I like to understand that a little bit more and there was a letter in the record I'm trying to remember the details of it that talked about. <coughs> more flexibility, and I don't think the letter clarified inside or outside Chancellor City, but TI improvements, uh, storefront improvements, that, that it, there's kind of this, it's a cumbersome, or I don't know if cumbersome was the word this person used, but you often are stuck going through a type three review when you're doing TIs for the new tenant that you just simply couldn't have known about when you designed your building, 
they want to change something, and I don't want to get into details because I'm not an expert at all in this area, but storefront improvements, moving a door, can we broaden the exemptions for those kind of situations? Um, and I don't know if a blanket, maybe Kat's <coughs> idea of not just 200 square foot, but a lineal or something, and should it apply Central City? I mean, is there I mean that, that, that's something to consider. I, the one thing I want to kind of just do a quick walk through with, say, an alteration or a storefront change is, so if it, let's say you're outside of Central City, you have that 200 square foot exemption. Let's say you, you can't meet that or or you're doing a little bit more than 200 square feet, you would have the option to either use meet the additional design standards, which there won't be that many standards that would apply for a, an alteration. If you do have to go through a discretionary review or decide to go through a discretionary review, um, essentially the, the, you would never go through a type three outside of Central City. You would go through a type one if the facade change is 500 square feet or less, which is the new sort of quicker um, discretion review, or if it was a larger scale, it would be a type two. So that's how that would work outside Central City. Yeah, in yeah. in Central City, there's there's some lower thresholds on those things, but. I'm not gonna try to figure out what the right criteria are, what square footage, design. I'm simply from a policy perspective. I was struck by, it seems to me, as we're trying to streamline to some extent design review, is there an opportunity to look at TI, storefront, renovations and not impose even any regulatory review just uh, is, is there a threshold or is there a sense of no this will have a dramatic impact and therefore we need to regulate it or is there a category we could define of and again I'm being loose with my terminology but storefront TIs something along those lines that simply you don't have to go through the regulatory process. We're going to spare you because we feel as a policy matter this is simply not having a dramatic enough impact on public realm design. So I, I think you're looking question. I think you're looking at the right section. It's on page 19 and it's section N. So people come in for awnings all the time, add them, delete them, you know. So here is what the standards would be. Number two would be um, a storefront improvement, I think is what you're talking about. Alterations to existing ground floor, storefront glazing, emollient systems that use the same storefront components as existing si system. So that is that exemption. So you might wanna take a look at that and have a discussion of whether that's liberal enough or not. Uh, a lot of TIs come in for louvers and vents because they didn't know that there was going to be a restaurant there, and so they come in for a uh, new hood vent, and so that number three is that exemption for for the vent and louvers. Just let me ask you um, for a question. Yeah. So, got it. But now you're going to do a restaurant. You need a louver. You need a vent. Well, if it's open, if it's less than one square foot of the facade, that's okay. If it's more than one square foot, then we'll put you through. Can we just say it's okay? A louver event's okay. In other words, not say it's okay if it's this size, but place to, you know. I'm just trying to think through and get mm -hmm. some help from you guys as mm -hmm. to, yeah, we might not have to force the storefront improvement to figure out, oh, if we could move, you know, if it's one square foot, we can do it. But if it's two, we have to go through this expensive hassle of a design review. Is there a way to just go all the way on this and say, you know what, louvers and vents, fine. Or that, would that be a dramatic design impact? And well, there's a piece of me that likes what you're saying, Jeff. Um, <laughs> but you get paid for putting that louver design in a perfect place. Um, as a as a policymaker, not as an applicant. Yeah, well, I just I'm yeah. Just so I, I was about to exploit a situation that you it might make you rethink that. Okay, so, yeah, sure. so for instance, if I'm doing a storefront, um, I may decide that inside I don't want you to see anything because I've got storage like or display up against that storefront, and now basically I'm going to change that storefront out to be a blank wall. I think that's a problem. We don't want to allow that. So we have to have a discussion about, um, you know, so then you're back to if you completely just at blank let it happen or the entire th I've just put a big grease hood back there, and I'm going to put a big, huge louver that fills up that entire storefront space. May not want to see that either. So I think there's certainly – some good reason for some limits. Whether the limits or the thresholds are exactly correct, I haven't spent a lot of time getting my head wrapped around that. Um, but I, 
I, I would say, you know, if, especially when we're trying to focus on creating great public realms, it's actually kind of the one thing I think that started design review in the first place was a bunch of buildings in the central city that just put a bunch of big blank walls right on the ground floor. And you'd walk for, you know, an entire block, sometimes two, because the building next door did it as well with no storefronts. Was that a consequence of the initial design review or was that a consequence of subsequent TIs that took place after the building went through its initial design review? You're talking about the, the blank walls? What's the blank wall? I mean, what, what the design... Well, that's what, tr that's what created design review in the first place is a bunch of buildings that created very pedestrian, non-friendly right. streetscapes. I think the thing with the TI thing is it goes back to, and I don't know, you know, how you... you you'd have to talk about how often it gets triggered. So I can do one storefront, a year later I take out another storefront, a year later I take out another storefront. So there's, there, you know, it's back to this comment of at, at some point all of a sudden I've changed the entire, the entire block and made it solid unless we have some type of bounds on that. Well, we do have the base zone standards. So people can't continue to do that and have, you know, end up with a blank wall. But in thinking about this, there's the buildings that have, gone through design review, and now we're coming in for alterations, subsequent TIs, et cetera. And then there's the buildings that never went through anything because they're that old. And what do we want those alterations? How much True. how much change do we want to allow um, in that instance? And so this N is pretty important because those talk, speak to both of those. Um, when you're talking about like Louvre and let's say a storefront, if they're not exempt, they get kicked outside of Central City, probably to the standards tract. And the standards have, um, you can do more louvers and vents at a certain, you know, located a certain place on your public realm. So you can take a look at what those standards and how those align. And then if you can't meet that, then you get into design review. Thank you. So um, I'm going to be mindful of time here. I think that was what the main things. We only talked about outside Central City today. There's a similar conversation about thresholds for inside Central City. Um, I don't, um, it seems like maybe that's where we pick up next time, actually. Well, you have 15 minutes set aside, and we have 10 minutes now. We do have 10 yes. minutes? Yes. Because I know you have a hearing. Okay. Oh, 7 yeah, o'clock. I had 7.15 written down. Okay. my, so. I am not correct there. We have no time. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so I would say if you have um, any comments about uh, thresholds, either outside Central City or inside Central City, let us know. We don't have another work session until... December 19th, I believe, is our next one. Just putting on this next um, one. So I have, thank so you. I have it right here. Great. Yeah. Um, so our next steps are our next work session, number three, is on December 17th. Um, and I'm sorry if I forgot the detail, but I have a question for the officer or all of you on whether you want to set another deadline for yourselves for potential amendments from the things we discussed already and for the stuff that we're going to discuss on December 17th, which is process and design standards. We wanna start getting our list of potential amendments um, ready so we can have a more productive conversation with the design commission. Well, I, I guess I would um, certainly say we should try to have all of our amendments for the topics we've discussed to you before the next work session. Does that make sense? Does that give you time to pivot. I guess the only question would be if you have any time set aside at that work session to revisit anything that we've already talked about. That would imply that we'd have to have the amendments to you sooner. If not, um, then it's if we're just going to typically focus on the topics that you've got in front of us on the 17th, it seems like that would be good. Unless you think you might need more time because of complex amendments that might come your way? Well, our plan is not to write up the amendments. Our plan is just to have an, a list of what are the ideas. So when we do the three by three check-in um, so in early January or mid-January, we you have the list. So those of you who are participating in a three by three of here are the things that we're contemplating changing. Perfect. And then the design commission probably will have opinions about those things. So let's set goals for ourselves that by the next work session, we have amendments related to the topics we've just went through. That way it'll be fresher in everybody's minds um, to you. Okay. That sounds great. Standards working group.
proposed the other day. Yes. Yes. So there's a call for that. Right. Okay. So um, do you have a question about that? Well, or, yes. mm -hmm. Finish what you're doing. Then I'll do mine, so. so the the last thing for us, except for, for Jeff's comment, is um, about the standards working group. As you can see, this, this gets pretty detailed, pretty fast, um, pretty quick. Are there folks who are interested, or commissioners, that are interested in participating in a working group amongst yourselves? Um, and we, of course, would staff that and, and support the work for that. Um, to wade through the standards because those are significant. So how about we just make this easy and do a show of hands for those who might be interested in a working group and then we'll see where we're at as far as quorum. Uh, question, how, yeah. how does that jive with the uh, three by three? Yeah. Well, I think the working group was intended to be uh, us only, yes. whereas the three by three is the two commissions talking. And also, I think I'm hoping the standards working group can meet before the work session number three and come and lead the discussion with the rest of the commission so we can make more progress at that. I guess I need to be more specific. So if I'm already a member of the three by three, does that preclude you from being a no? Nope. Okay. So who is interested in meeting more to, to talk about this? I am. Looks like we've got one, two, am I counting three, four hands, five hands up. And we haven't really asked those commissioners who aren't here. So maybe let's send an email around okay. um, just to make sure that, you know, like Oriana is aware and Daisy. And then we're going to have a quorum issue. So we may... Um, either have to split up into two groups or see if once we know we have a quorum issue, if anybody's kind of was only lukewarm and not all that interested. Eli. Process thought is that if that's gonna meet before the third work session, um, when we do the call out for amendment ideas, it seems like we probably should have people, since not everyone's gonna be a part of that group, list off ideas for the design um, standards, even though we haven't discussed it yet, so the people in that working group can see what people have in mind does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So I'm imagining sort of a table where people list, here's the idea I have for the design standards, and here's why, you know, and just list those out. That way, whoever's in this group has those in front of them when they when they talk. So that, that sort of pulls the, the need to put amendments on the table um, for design standards a little bit earlier than we otherwise would. We haven't talked about it yet, but um, if that's going to feed into that sort of special working group process, we have to get those people to stuff, or at least we try to. Okay, we'll get that out. I'm just, for the hay of it, thinking December 1st for the standards. I don't you should look at kind of the whole schedule, but knowing that we've got a holiday coming up here, that's, yeah, seems like it might so be a, think a good place to start. Yeah, so maybe we'll set one deadline so you don't have multiple deadlines to yep. go by. One deadline to get us all of your amendment ideas for everything, because then the only thing that's left off the table is process. And it would be nice to know if some people are already thinking about process amendments um, to get those on the table, too. And so we'll share that at the, at the work session, the third work session. Okay. I the mm -hmm. idea, I think, is that this would streamline the whole standards discussion. That, that would right? be the hope, yes. is that we can Probably put a whole bunch on consent. That are, okay. Yep, and then perhaps have some others for just flat-out discussion. Okay. Great. Thank you for that suggestion, Eli. Okay. Thank you very much. Oh, yes, sorry, uh, Jeff. That's right. You sent out an email on Friday that said we were going to revisit something to do with our discussion about design guideline 6. Are we not going to do that, or is that changed or I'm just curious what happened that's true what's guidelines that's true which, um, was, which was guidelines, guidelines six is <laughs> was this with regards to the letter opportunities oh. for yeah, us at we interact so I can we bring that back at the next work session yeah that might make sense because is that too late with where the design commission will be um, design commission will be talking about public realm guidelines on December the 5th on December the 5th so, um, potentially. Okay. So they're talking about December 5th. We sent them a slight word change, but we haven't explained as a, right. as a PSC what that word change meant. Thank you for bringing that up again. We, but Kat, you are going to be at the... Yeah, but I won't, we won't be able to have deliberate over the language that was being proposed to be added to the, com to the background information. Okay. 
Okay. Sure. So how about, let's talk about the officers meeting. So we, we're not, because we're not going to be able to deliberate tonight right. on we it. We don't have the language in front exactly. of Exactly. Ariana's not here also. So I'm we'll have to table it. Sequence because I, I was considering writing my own letter to design review as we talked about some of us were going to do on various guidelines. Well, you've missed the, the well, hearing. Well, I missed the deadline because I was told we were going to reconsider and discuss it. So I was caught in this catch-22 of I decided not to write a letter because I didn't know if we were re reconsidering it here today. So were you writing a letter with regards to those points that we pulled from the letter? Because that's the only. I was going to write a letter explaining my opposition to the word change with okay. the design guideline six. But I felt my letter would be premature and inappropriate until I knew what the majority was going to be saying about the word change. Yeah, fair enough. So that's the thing that we're waiting to deliberate on. I think we all have to have a discussion, and we will formulate a suggestion at some point <laughs> altogether <laughs> to then take to the design commission. Before design commission deliberates. So just right. really quickly, um, Stacy and I are trying to maybe rethink the order of tenants that we discuss with design commission. We were intending to go to them with public realm because that is the easiest one. Just kidding. Um, <laughs> um, well, maybe it was. Uh, maybe it was. Uh, but so we may be able to switch, but can we just confirm that um, at the officers? Yeah, that's what I was going to say. I think yes. we need to take so it at the officers. It may not be an issue if um, if we don't if we put off the discussion on public realm until January or when's the next one? Until later in December. December nineteenth. Okay. And then it would. We also have the three by three check in, which I think would also be a, a good place if there's. Any kind of, you know, you folks have discussions about what you think guideline six should mean, and the design commission is going in a, in a direction maybe a little different from that. I, I think the three by three check-in would be the place to, to also come back in and, and try to see if we can align that. Absolutely agree. I just think that we probably need to get them the language prior to that for them to deliberate over as a body prior to the three by three. Yes, Jeff. I just want to be clear. I was quite concerned about significance behind the language change this commission voted for. The words alone really don't tell the intent. So now we have these words out there we're saying to the design commission, add the word rest and welcome. Without context, it's sort of ambiguous. And so I'm asking when are we going to clarify because that may influence whether or not I feel it's necessary or appropriate to add my own comments to the design review. So I'm sort of left hanging that we've only delivered half a loaf on what was a robust discussion. So, so I think I, I would say we're all in agreement, or many of us are in agreement. The reason the words behind that explain the rest and welcome were not included in the letter is because they didn't necessarily align with all the deliberations that we had, and we felt we needed to rediscuss right. no, it. Okay. Right. And we will definitely rediscuss it as a body and then come to some type of consensus as to what we would suggest on how to define the words rest and welcome, or who knows where it goes from there. I mean, I guess, but we need to continue a deliberation. There's, oh, there's oh, no doubt. I guess so. That deliberation will happen before our deadline 17th. of when. Design review is going to take this up. That's what we're struggling with trying to make happen, yes. But we. Correct. I think that's correct. I think that work. But December 17th is our schedule. What's yes. the design review schedule? That December 19th. What? December 19th. Okay, thank yes. you. We will figure it out. So you can expect to have a conversation about that on December 17th. And our apologies for not bringing that yeah. today because that was our intent, but we completely lost it. That's okay. So thank you very much. And um, I think we're done with this agenda. Perfect. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. For those who are here for the transportation system plan um, update, hearing, and recommendation, thank you for bearing with us. Um, so um, I, as we're getting going on this, I would like to ask, are there any disclosures? Yes, Steph. Um, it's, it, it's not a conflict of interest, but for transparency, I'm uh, contracting a bit with uh, Portland Bureau of Transportation on a matter not related to the TSP. Thank you, Steph. <laughs> and 
Yeah, I was just going to ask Julie. It looks like you've got uh, testimony cards. And if there's anybody here who would like to testify um, but has not filled out a, a testimony card, if you could do so, that'd be great. And we will be limiting testimony to two minutes. You can get going. Thank, Thank you. Um, I appreciate, uh, uh, and members of the commission, appreciate um, the discussion and uh, feedback we received from you and the member at our briefing on this subject, and happy to be back today for the hearing um, to take action um, on this uh, transportation system plan update. Uh, for the record, my name is Eric Hessa, um, and I'm a section manager in our planning division um, for the team responsible for our policy and regional planning um, that manages the, uh, the update and maintenance of the transportation system plan element of comprehensive plan. Uh, so I'd like to turn it over to Bob Kellett, who's been the project manager on this MIT, to walk us through a brief review of what we discussed last time um, and to frame up the conversation for this evening. Thank you, Eric, and thank you, commissioners. I want to thank everybody who's uh, come out tonight as well to testify. I know coming downtown on a uh, Tuesday evening is not always easy, so it really is truly appreciated for all of you to be here. Um, so like Eric said, I'm going to go over just a brief overview of uh, what we're doing, why we're here tonight. I don't somehow figure out how to do the uh, PowerPoint. <laughs> how do I go back? Back. I go back. Right. Oops. Oops. Maybe. Sorry about this. Sneak preview everything you're going to see. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, tonight we are here uh, for a hearing and a recommendation to the City Council. Uh, we were back last year on October 8th, gave you a briefing then on the minor update to the 2035 CSP. Um, go forward. Uh, so why are we doing this? Uh, since the TSP was adopted by City Council in three phases from 2016 through 2018, there have been a number of inputs that have uh, been also adopted by Council or by the region. The Regional Transportation Plan was updated PED PDX, our pedestrian master plan was updated. We had an enhanced transit corridors plan, uh, looking at ways to improve reliability and speed of transit, as well as a growing transit communities plan. So all of those inputs uh, feed into the TSP and we're bringing in the recommendations from those plans through this update. Uh, what are we changing this? We're in four different categories with policies, classifications, major projects, and the supporting chapters of the TSP. From a policy standpoint, we have some minor policy changes. Uh, 9.22, public transportation is a recommendation, a word change from the Enhanced Transit Corridors Plan. 9.49 uh, in our community involvement objectives, uh, we're doing some housekeeping where we had some errors that we're bringing together in alignment with the comp plan. And then 9.69 and 9.68 are existing connected and automated vehicles policies, which we are proposing to uh, include new mobility, so we're expanding the, the, we're broadening those, those policies. Uh, as far as classifications go, we are uh, recommending the uh, pedestrian classifications, the citywide ones that are recommended through uh, PED PDX. Uh, we're proposing updating four of our existing bikeways from city bikeway to major city bikeway. Uh, these are the 20s bikeway, the 50s bikeway, Southeast Foster and uh, 148th, Northeast and Southeast. Uh, we're doing this uh, to bring those Alignment, those uh, classifications into better alignment with what's in the regional transportation plan. Uh, and then we are also uh, have a, a series of mapping errors that we're correcting for in the bicycle classifications, a couple emergency response that were pointed out by our fire bureau, and uh, a couple of design classification uh, mapping errors that we're correcting. Uh, as far as major projects go, uh, we have two sort of buckets. One is amending a, a subset of existing projects. Uh, these might be changes in the... Um, the length of the project or the project uh, amount, uh, project description. These are these are things that have been uh, recommended through refinement planning efforts. Uh, the other bucket of projects are adding new projects, the financially unconstrained list. Uh, these are all projects that have come from enhanced transit corridors, growing transit, and uh, regional transportation plan. Uh, as far as the supporting chapters go, we're doing some uh, relatively minor editing to that, updating the uh, introduction to reflect it's the TSP's adoption. We're shortening it so it's a little bit easier to read. Uh, the modal plans, we're updating it to re reflect the adoption of existing plans. The implementation strategies, we're uh, changing it a little bit to reflect some of the work that has been done. 
as well as some of the recommended planning that is uh, in the 2018 RTP, the Regional Transportation Plan. And then the glossary, uh, we've eliminated terms that are not in the TSP anymore, as well as proposing to add a definition for no mo new mobility so that when we are broadening policies 9.68 and 9.69, uh, we know what the definition is. Uh, lastly, what we've heard so far uh, through our discussion draft and through the proposed draft uh, from the public, we want to thank everybody for submitting their testimony, for the groups that invited us to come out and speak and talk and listen. Uh, we do really truly appreciate everything that we've heard. Uh, as far as um, feedback we've gotten, we know that Commissioner Smith last time uh, raised a question about the Sandy Boulevard bicycle classification, uh, expressing desire to change that from its existing classification, which is a city bikeway, to a major city bikeway. Uh, we are not proposing to do that at this time. Uh, the existing classification is in alignment with what is in the Regional Transportation Plan. Uh, we know that Sandy is a, is a, has a lot of potential as a street, and it has the highest classifications of a lot of our different modes. So we know that there's a lot of interest in transit and freight and pedestrian activity as well as automobile and bicycle. And so uh, it's, it's our, our thought that we really should be doing more of a corridor plan for that before we come to you for recommendation for a classification. So we'd like to do that first. We'd like to look at Sandy from a corridor perspective and also from a system perspective to um, best determine the future use of Sandy and also engaging our community members in that conversation, of course. Uh, other things we've heard from the pedestrian classifications, uh, we heard some uh, interest in the pedestrian districts that are proposed in PED PDX. These are tied to the uh, comprehensive plan district uh, centers. And so um, the idea being that we're we're combining land use and transportation so that we're making the places that we see growth in the city in the future really truly walkable. Uh, we've heard some, some questions about, well, what does that mean? What does it look like? Does that diminish some of the streets that already are kind of like the, the premier pedestrian streets? And we think it really supports uh, better pedestrian activity everywhere, actually. So um, we're pretty comfortable with what we proposed. Uh, we had some questions from the Development, uh, uh, development Review Advisory Committee draft about the implementation of the pedestrian classification since we are introducing new classifications. They were you know, curious how is that gonna look, what's gonna mean in terms of sidewalk frontage improvements, that sort of thing. Uh, we do have a, a memo that was signed by our city engineer that spells out kind of what that's gonna look like um, as we go forward with developing new pedestrian design uh, guidelines and that's gonna be work that's done in the next year or two. So we do have a, a memo that kind of addresses some of the concerns that were raised at draft. Uh, as far as other class, other uh, things we've heard from the project level, uh, we had some conversations with Southwest Trails. Uh, there's a, a long desired uh, project for the, the Red Electric Trail running pretty much the length of Southwest Portland. Uh, we have six projects that point to the Red Electric Trail already in the TSP. And so they were just wanted to make sure that the projects that we have in the TSP reflect uh, the potential alignments that they're looking to, to have built as, a, as projects. And we talked with the, Par the Parks Bureau, they were a partner on us when we developed Red Electric Trail study back in 2007. And we're comfortable that um, we have, the projects we have right now don't need to be amended and that the concerns that were raised by Southwest Trails can be met through the actual planning process that will happen when those trails are being built. Uh, we did hear from the friend of Green Loop. Uh, the Green Loop was a concept that developed in the center, uh, through the comprehensive plan idea being a premier sort of walking, biking, green loop around the center city. Uh, that was a concept that raised during the comprehensive plan. Right now, uh, PBOT and DPS are working pretty closely to kind of develop that. And so the comments from the friend of the green loop was, were excellent and we really appreciate them, but they're a little bit premature in terms of uh, what we want to put into the TSP. We still are doing work on that and uh, are excited to be coming forward in the future with a more developed concept plan that includes an alignment for that loop and also design guidelines for what's gonna, what, what the green loop will eventually look like. Uh, like I mentioned back in our briefing on October 8th, uh, we had an originally planned to have some projects that were being recommended in the Southwest in Motion Plan uh, incorporated into the TSP. Because of scheduling conflicts, that, uh, that planning effort has been postponed until a December 5th council hearing. Uh, so we're, we're comfortable with waiting until council makes a decision on whether or not those recommendations come forward and we can certainly bring those uh, recommendations into a future TSP update. Uh, the last thing we have heard uh, throughout this process is we've heard a lot of support for enhanced transit. 
people are saying they want better transit, faster transit, more reliable transit. And so there has been support for those projects as well as the burgeoning idea of the Rose Lane project that um, we're starting to see roll out on the streets. So that is my very quick summary of what we're doing. Um, do we want to open it to testimony now? Is that shorter? Yeah, I'll, I will just, are there any quick questions? Go ahead, Mike. Yeah, I was curious, uh, given the trail um, emphasis, emphasis at the end, did the 40 mile loop folks have any input on this out of curiosity? Because there are right. gaps on, on Marine Drive, for example. Yeah, no, I, I didn't hear anything from 40 mile loop. Great, thank you. Chris. Oh, sorry, Chris missed you. <laughs> that wasn't a slight. Just want to make clear uh, my intention to offer an amendment uh, to classify Sandy as a major city bikeway from southeast Washington to northeast 122nd in case anybody wants to comment on that in testimony. Great. Thanks, Chris. Okay. Thank you very much. Oh, sorry, Steph. No, it's all good. I just add. Um, so did you say the projects that the Green Loop and others will be included? or? Uh, so we have existing plan. projects in the TSP that support the Green Loop, and so they, they say specifically in the TSP descriptions, um, you know, build a bikeway on Park Ave, the park blocks that is supportive of the Green Loop. Um, and so we're not proposing making any changes to that at this time. Uh, we would hate to amend an existing project and only have it turn out that the alignment's gonna be different in the future based on future planning. Okay, Thank you. I guess I ask because every time I hear the Green Loop, I'm like, what about the poor cousin, Green Ring? Right, yes. And that, Signed, East Portland. And that is, uh, I appreciate that. There, that definitely is on Peabot's mind as well, um, the Green Ring in, in Lentz area. And uh, there are a number of smaller scale projects that are kind of in the works for this summer and later. That, that's going to support that concept as well. Okay. Thank you. Okay, I think. No more questions. Okay. Thank you very much. We will now open it up to testimony. If you're here to testify... At the moment, I just have three, um, but if you're here um, and you haven't given um, me a card, oh, there we go, there's a fourth, um, please hand it to Julie. Um, please fill out a testimony form so we can take it. Um, since we have four, I'm going to call up two at a time. Um, and again, we're asking that you limit your testimony to two minutes. So Brian Brady and Glenn Bridger, please. Thank you, Julie. Okay. Well, good evening, and thank you. Uh, my name is Brian Brady. Uh, Glenn and I are here today representing Southwest Trail community group focused on improvements of some pedestrian routes in Southwest Portland. Our purpose today is to ask for a slight change to the TSP regarding the Red Electric Trail. Uh, and just for a brief history on that, uh, Red Electric is the name for a former rail line that connected outlying areas of, uh, of Portland with Central Portland. Uh, the alignment was abandoned about 90 years ago, uh, and much of what remains today sits as a basement corridor. Uh, we envision this trail as a west side counterpart to the Spring Water Corridor. So you see this basic map we made here. That's our red electric alignment and the Spring Water Trail up here. So essentially this bisects in the city. Uh, Southwest Trails as an organization has the most hands-on experience uh, regarding trails in Southwest Portland. And we seek an opportunity to provide uh, some detailed uh, input to the planned future right now. Uh, our focus today is on the eastern end of the red electric trail. This is what they're calling segment six, and this is in George Himes Park, so just for reference, OHSU is just to the north, Wilson High School is just over here uh, to, to, the, to the east. Uh, we would like to request changes to project, uh, numbers are kind of ridiculous on here, but 379, uh, the red electric trail segment six, so that it connects directly with the project 373, and this is a proposed slate and road. Um, uh, now's the time to do this, given that the Newberry structure, that's the Barber Boulevard crossing here, is to be updated as part of Project 013, the Inner Barber Corridor Improvement Project. <laughs> uh, we'd like to propose this, uh, an integration of these three projects to allow a continuous pedestrian and cyclist link from the Garden Home neighborhood 
to the OHSU South Waterfront campus and uh, onto downtown. Uh, and Glenn will now discuss in further detail, I think I've got my two minutes, I don't want to go over here, uh, what we seek in, in further detail. Good morning, uh, my name is Glenn Bridger. Uh, when City Council approved of uh, the Red Electric Trail Plan in, uh, <coughs> I believe it was 2007, they approved three different alignments on the east end of the trail. Uh, only one of those is reflected in the TSP. We're asking that the TSP be adjusted to reflect what we see as a much preferred alignment and a more important alignment uh, that goes along the uh, area of Corbett and uh, Slavin Roads. Now, what are the reasons for this? Number one is equity. Now, there is a nice cluster of uh, low income, there we have, uh, of public housing and low income housing uh, just back of the Rasmussen Apartments at the end of Slavin Road. By continuing Slavin Road and connecting directly into the Red Electric, be, being a part of the Red Electric, we can improve the access from this housing cluster uh, by giving them additional access to and from the south, which is very important for, for their community. Second reason for this is now is the time. We all know Southwest Corridor is coming. It is in its uh, refinement uh, stages of planning. There is going to be construction and design activity at the Newberry structure, the Barber area now. Uh, that will be a once in a lifetime event. And now is the time to make sure that we have proper accommodations for the red electric, for pedestrian and bicycle connections in that area. So that we want it on the TSP so that it is on the attention of the Southwest Corridor Project people. Now is that time for to do that. And the third item is the joy for users. Now, which would you rather do? Take the straight downhill line that you can see jogging straight down, you have to go back to one, uh, yeah, goes right down Iowa and goes down the hill, or would you rather take a more gentle grade, which is the Slavin Road, <coughs> road uh, path? I, as a walker, look at the uphill climb that's presently on the TSP as more of a forced march rather than a desirable walk. And I think the bicyclists, especially those who are well, they're working with legs or electricity. They're not going to want to go through that pain either unless they're really in for a workout. Thank you. There's a lot of joy to be experienced by having this route as the desired route and the one on the TSP that gets built. Thank you very much. Appreciate you coming out tonight. Uh, next. Uh, individuals, Keith Jones and Richard Shepard. And if there's anybody else here? No? Okay. So these will be our last two, unless you'll get my attention somehow. Hi, Commissioner. Thank you very much. Uh, and I'm having a hard time hearing you, so. This a little better? That is fabulous. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you, commissioners, and thank you, Bob, and everyone at Piedmont for putting this uh, TSP together. Um, I just want to point out that in light of the recent growth uh, that we've been seeing in carbon emissions in Portland from single occupancy vehicles, an increase in traffic violence-related deaths, as well as a drop in bicycle mode share from 6.3 to 5.3 percent across Portland. Um, my name is RJ Shepard. I'm part of Bike Loud PDX, and we are increasingly concerned that the transportation system plan still does not address the current current crises that Portlanders face. Um, we ask that you consider a couple of minor uh, changes to the uh, transportation system plan. Um, first is to replace level of service with reduction in VMT as the primary uh, means by which we measure our streets. Um, that's more in line with the statewide goals uh, of reducing our transportation uh, or VMT um, by 10% over the next 20 years, as well as also our climate action goals, as well as Vision Zero goals. Um, we also are in agreement with uh, Commissioner uh, Smith in adding uh, Sandy Boulevard as a major city bikeway to the transportation system plan, as Sandy is one of 30 high crash corridors. Eight people have been killed on Sandy in the last 10 years, and one person was walking across Sandy at uh, Northeast 26th in a marked crosswalk 
and sustained life-threatening in injuries just a few weeks ago. We know that protected bike in, uh, facilities have shown to reduce speeds and therefore reduce the frequency and severity of crashes. Sandy also runs through three pedestrian districts. The high speeds on Sandy are a barrier, both figuratively and literally, to making these pedestrian districts uh, successful. Uh, Sandy can help improve the public realm and create stickiness along those main streets, um, with cafes opening to a stream of low-carbon transportation devices rather than smelly automobiles. Uh, providing low-cost transportation along Sandy has significant equity implications, as there are three census tracts along Sandy that have significant low-income residents with English as a second language. Uh, since Sandy is primarily zoned uh, commercial mixed use, um, which can provide affordable market rate and subsidized housing, um, we think that uh, providing the uh, major city bikeway classification can assist those uh, rent burdened households, which uh, we know that nearly 50% of Portlanders are rent burdened, spending more than 30% of their income on rent. Um, and we know that Sandy also is going to be able to provide a direct access uh, to job centers. Um, we have uh, both the central city and uh, the airport and employers near there. So uh, thank you. Yeah. If you could wrap it up. Uh, sorry. Uh, so that's uh, right now a very uh, zigzag journey. It's almost uh, seven and a half, eight miles, um, which takes you across a lot of busy streets uh, that are sig not signal controlled, um, whereas providing Sandy would be a direct five mile journey. So uh, we encourage that as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Hi. Welcome. Keith Jones, is that, can you hear me? Yep. <laughs> it should work. It, it will go. It's all good. There ah, it works. Yeah, right. there okay. you go. Hi, I'm Keith Jones. I'm uh, the director of Friends of Green Loop. And also would like to shout out to Green Ring. I'm a big fan. And I think we can all play together, too. Um, I wanted to thank you for the opportunity to testify on this important project. I've already written a letter um, and submitted it. So I hope you've seen a copy of that. Uh, I'm just going to hit a few of the highlights real quick, and hopefully they're not too premature. Uh, generally, the language for the Cultural District street Streetscape Plan and the Green Loop Concept Plan should be updated to reflect the work that has been done to date. Portland Parks and Recreation, in partnership with the Bureau of Transportation, is leading the South Park Blocks Master Plan through the Cultural District that will determine the alignment, location, and performance criteria for the loop, effectively accomplishing this plan. The Green Loop Concept Plan should be updated to reflect the fact that uh, much of the alignment has been determined through other community projects and that what's needed right now is more detailed design direction. In terms of specific projects, I'd like to only highlight a couple on 7th Avenue uh, corridor uh, project in the Central East Side. There's a new demonstrated need for a pedestrian and wheeled connection across the Union Pacific uh, Railroad from OMSI to Lower Central East Side, roughly in the vicinity of the streetcar bridge, which, because it lacks pedestrian or bicycle facilities on it, is a reason for this new project. In Lloyd uh, Rose Quarter, I uh, th think more coordination outreach is needed with the Albina Vision Trust. In the North Park blocks, where I'm currently working to relocate food carts displaced by the Block 216 development as part of the culinary corridor concept, more outreach is needed with the homeless advocacy community and the social service providers in the area. And finally, there's an increasingly urgent need to advance the design work for the entire loop, confirming the alignment, determining the position of loop facilities within the street, and identifying the dimensions of spaces, pathways, tree planting areas, and desired materials. Development proposals continue to come in all around the alignment, and lack of clear design direction results in process delays, project uncertainty, extended reviews, and frustration on all sides. There's a large body of design work that can be built on with more targeted effort that brings the project to the ground in specialized ways responding to the different communities through which the loop passes. Thank you so much. Thank you both very much for coming tonight. Could I ask Keith a question? Sure. Yeah. So you commented on the, the streetcar bridge and the need for an additional crossing of the rail main line there. Yeah. So I was involved in the planning for that and oh. specifically asked the question, should we have bike ped facilities on that? And the discussion at that time, there were two factors. One was, um, well, several factors. One was the 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 geography necessitated that that have a very steep grade greater than ADA standards. So that was a you know, big challenge for pedestrian facilities. Um, and it wasn't clear that there were really any desire lines when you got to the top of that, uh, that particular stretch of MLK. Um, and the strategic decision was uh, focus on Clinton to the river instead. Now Clinton to the river was just a concept at that point. Now it's a reality. It, I guess my question is, is your perception that there's a need for additional crossing mean that Clinton to the river doesn't do it well enough or? I think also it needs to, to tie into the new OMSI master plan too. I see. And OMSI actually does have 
a wish to see this happen as part of their, hmm. their project. Okay. And so I've met with them a number of times to talk about this, and it's something that they felt was important but are disappointed it's not included in the projects. Uh, uh, so, yeah. Okay. I probably need to get a little smarter about that plan. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is there anybody else here to testify tonight? I'm not seeing anybody, so we will close testimony at this time. Why don't we go ahead and have you gentlemen come back up and see if there's any clarifying questions that anybody would like to ask. We'll also be joined by uh, Courtney Duke, um, senior planner on our team as well, who I failed to introduce earlier, but also supported the project. Um, Great. You're anticipating some questions on the Red Electric Trail, are you not? <laughs> That's fabulous. I, I was extremely pregnant at the time. <laughs> 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 I don't remember. And I just started high school. So. <laughs> uh, so it looks like Mike has his hand up for questions. Yeah, regarding uh, the Red Electric, um, I actually lived in those houses on, on Slavin. And I've also led a number of uh, hikes that I call the, the Cheapskate hike where you start at South Waterfront, walk down the Greenway, and then up from Corbett past a house up under the freeway um, to um, George Himes. And my, the concern I have with, I'm, I'm not sure if we're talking either or here, but that's a really important link that I would hate to see lost because it's actually part of a, a very a great loop system. Uh, from the Greenway. So I don't know, what's your, what's your response to uh, yes. the Red Electric? I really appreciate the comments that, uh, you know, since Courtney's job's born, there's been some uh, additional <laughs> thought given to where the line of the trail may be. And uh, that's you know, one day your, your son will be able to use that trail. Um, and we definitely, I'd love to have the CSF of Southwest Trail move to come to the and to move as an issue. Um, but there is an opportunity that's ahead of us with, with the Southwest corridor. That said, from the TSP perspective, uh, we do have a project. The project is for segment six of the Red Electric Trail. It says construct segment six of the Red Electric Trail as recommended in the Red Electric Trail planning study. Okay, so that's that's a pretty broad project that just says look at the study. And so when you look at the study, it has three different alternatives, and that decision has not been made what the alternative is. And so the map that was shown is showing one of the alternatives that was identified in that study, but it doesn't include a different route. So in talking with the Parks Bureau, who would be the ones you know, leading that effort, they, they assured me that, that they're not including uh, the, the route that's being proposed. Okay, that's good. Um, yeah, I, I have huge respect for the Southwest Trails folks, Don, and I've had many interactions over the years. And maybe I'll just add, I think part of that challenge is there's the, the project and the project list, and then it references other plans that can um, show a number of alignments. At the same time, I think that the interactive mapping tools that we have available um, also are trying to be sort of clear. And when you have you know hundreds of projects representing to have every potential alignment reflected in a plan on that geography can be challenging. So I can certainly appreciate the concern about seeming elimination of those, those elements. And so I think that's just something that we can continue to work with Southwest Trails to understand. But I think as, as Bob is also suggesting the TSP level mapping is one level of, of des description and then there which is sort of helping people understand in general you sort of click onto that line to then get a sense of what the project elements are versus then the actual design and, and that process and so that's I think one of the, the challenges that we're just working with in these tools that I wanted to point out. So perhaps you could help me understand is with the Southwest Corridor project and that um, bridge piece that their segment that they're talking about what how, how, what's the timing for all those parts and pieces to kind of come together so that um, should, as well, as Southwest Corridor moves forward, y things aren't precluded maybe if the design work about the different trail paths haven't caught up? Yeah, so I mean, Southwest Corridor, you're looking at what, 2027? I think is opening yeah, estimate, yeah, yes. Opening of 2027. Uh, so a lot of the work is happening right now, and so our project team that's liaison to the regional effort around Southwest Corridor is, is involved with that, and they are working with parks. And so parks, when I was having this conversation, they wanted to make sure that they were talking to the right people within PBOT, we're talking to the right people within parks, um, because they see it as an opportunity as well. And so um, I don't think we're late in, in that opportunity. I think it's, this is the time, and so I think that's also you know, obviously why 
Southwest Trails is so interested because this is the time. So help me understand a little better how that ties together from a TSP perspective. Uh, are the viaduct projects for Southwest Corridor in the TSP now? Yes, they are, yeah. They're, they're, and those are ODOT projects. Okay. An ODOT project, because it it's an ODOT facility. So it's a question of how we take multiple TSP projects and make sure they happen in a coordinated manner to achieve the benefit that Southwest Trails is looking for. Absolutely, right. yes. Okay. I think I understand. I, and it reflects the plan as adopted. Mm -hmm. And uh, like Bob mentioned, that our TSP project re specifically references the adopted plan that has those three options. And so again, any of our staff and ourselves that are working together with ODOT and Southwest Corridor would look to that to see what's the best alignment. And then for my other comment would be also then for that alignment and conversation to have more public involvement and community conversation than a change here, that that's where that, that conversation needs to happen is during the project phase or during that decision phase. Right, if I could draw an analogy, when the TSP came through, we said the bikeway should be on Northeast 7th. <laughs> City Council, trying to avoid political controversy, said it should be on 7th or 9th. And then we spent three years in project development trying to decide between those two streets and are edging up on an answer, right? So similar kind of process here that really the hard decisions have to happen at project development time, right? Yeah, which from my recollection is one reason we put the three options in there is because mm -hmm. we couldn't at that high level of planning right. to make that decision again. And at that time, Southwest Corridor was even a further glimmer than it mm -hmm. is today. So I believe that's the reason we kept those three options rather than picking one at the time and keeping those options open for when the design actually came through. Right. So you're confident that the envelope created by those projects is big enough that we can steer the right trail through it when the time comes in project development? Yes. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and, and I'll just, well, that, this has gotten hot. Uh, Mike's back. Uh, um, you know, I, we don't disagree in, in principle with, with wanting to make sure that that best design happens. And so both as that project moves forward, our other team members working there will do so. And I think we're confident, just to state for the record, that um, our comp coordination with Parks suggests that th those options are all absolutely on the table. And so our intent by responding um, here is not to preclude that to conversation, but rather support it. Right. So Glenn and Brian, you now have it in the meetings from this minute that they said it was possible. So. <laughs> Are there any other questions? Not on that project, but I do want to get to Sandy. Um, looks like, Katie, you maybe yeah, had I something. Do, I do. Um, I just um, I wanted to uh, compliment you guys and also, actually, the city of Portland, really, on the fact that a lot of the new uh, projects that are going in are in East Portland, and they're based on um, this kind of new way of looking at what we should do a project on and what kinds of things that we should be evaluating. And so when I first got involved with East Portland, we would find that oftentimes things that we wanted to have happen in East Portland weren't, um, they weren't even a project. People didn't even know about them. And so what I'm seeing now is that the project, the, the studies are being done on, um, on these, for example, the enhanced um, transit, where the projects that come out of that f will feed now directly into the TSP, and so they can be done. And so I just, I really am seeing that over the time that I've been involved. Now, one of the, but I did want to ask, so now that these, um, there's these two different streams of projects, there's the projects that have um, funding, and then the projects that don't have funding yet. So what happens? How do they be, how do they go from having funding or not having funding to being funded? So in other words, they've been kind of blessed and said, okay, we think these are good projects. So how did they, they then become um, funded? That's a, that's a really good question. It's something that we, we get a lot of questions from. It, mm -hmm. um, from the TSP perspective, uh, having the financial list and an unconstrained list, mm -hmm. the constrained and the unconstrained, it doesn't indicate actual funding. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it indicates that when we did our financial plan, 
we, had, we know in the next 20 years we have this pie of money and we can fit these projects into that pie. And so that's, that's the financially constrained list. Right. Everything outside of the pie is, if we, have, we can grow the pie, then we can do those projects. Um, and so uh, I know that's a little bit confusing when you're thinking of like a capital plan, which is saying in the next five years we're going to build X number of projects in East Portland and they're going to cost X amount of money. Um, so it's, it's a little bit of a nuance between a, a system plan like this and a mm -hmm. capital development plan. Mm -hmm. uh, that said, if, if a project, like the projects we're bringing into the unconstrained financial list, um, we will seek money for them. Uh, in some cases, there might be some money tied um, either through, a, you know, through the region or through federal money or, or using local money as well. It's just uh, projects you know, get through a prioritization process and then it's sort of an opportunistic way of which we match up the funding with the project. Mm -hmm. And so the, um, the, uh, the total uh, point scores that you sent me, those are going to determine the order? Uh, not necessarily. I mean, they definitely indicate uh, projects that meet our, our desired outcomes, and the higher mm -hmm. the score is going to reach a higher level of outcomes. Um, it doesn't necessarily lead to a ranked, this project's going to go before this project, goes before this project. Uh -huh. um, a lot of our projects, we end up you know, working with other bureaus, so you know, the water bureau is going to be ripping up uh, part of our streets. We can fix something there. Mm -hmm. um, and so you know, having an order list would be pretty hard to follow based on... Kind of okay. The reality of the funding world. Transportation funding is, I mean, it's almost as, as complicated as what you just spent with DOZA. It's, you know, it's <laughs> money coming from, from so many different buckets and pools and, and sort of piecing that together to make projects um, makes, it, makes, it, makes it difficult to, to sort of figure right. that out. That said, you know, we do want to get to the point where we're programming out things in a more straightforward, transparent, easier to understand from a public mm -hmm. standpoint. Um, and so that's, that's the intention that we're moving towards. Right, because I think what happens for um, uh, citizens who are working on these projects is that the, when they see some more charismatic project uh, push ahead of theirs or for in, in a nicer part of town, they immediately cry foul. And, and it's just really hard to watch that happen over and over and over again. So what, would, um, what kinds of things would keep that from happening? Or... I guess the opposite would be question would be how do, how does that always happen? How does that happen? I don't mean I, I that was a slip of the tongue. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I'll just I'll just note that um, as I think was Bob was was suggesting um, in terms of that sort of prioritization of of the the um, financially constrained versus un, un, unconstrained. It's while it's not the exact funding plan for capital improvement, it does. Uh, reflect how that prioritization um, piece, which, as you not acknowledged earlier, has shifted quite a lot of investment to yeah, traditionally underserved yeah. areas. So that that says these are priorities, and so mm -hmm. that's both in terms of what we would suggest for sort of funding priority is what that re list reflects, and then to some degree potentially also that sort of first ten years versus latter latter ten years in the twenty year horizon of the plan. Sometimes that also reflects sort of the relative readiness of certain corridors or other development pieces, or as this, for example the Southwest corridors we mentioned, how that's moving ahead. Head. So there's a couple different considerations there, but that's looking to help reflect that sort of general priority. And then, as Bob said, there are certain funding programs that are targeted very specifically to elements, and so um, that's where certain subsets of projects may simply be more competitive. And so that's mm -hmm. one key cause for sort of shifting of doing that. Um, but I think overall our hope is that we continue to as we do refinement plans in specific areas, work to reflect um, what the community's desire, make sure that it's a great, compelling project that we can then, for example, get regional funding for in advance. And, and right now, we're working uh, with the Metro uh, table on that. And, and actually, our projects into the regional flexible funds process are five of the top six projects funded. And actually, the rest of the region is saying, hey, you're taking too much money. We're saying we've got great projects reflecting the outcomes our region is saying. So I think we're, we're doing a great job of, of, of sec trying to secure those funds so that we mm -hmm. frankly don't have the hard choices of not enough money to implement everything because all these projects are worthwhile. So that's right. a, a little bit of it. It's a bit of a tricky answer because it's, um, it is those sort of matching up the money with, with the project and the readiness types of things. But I think continuing to um, engage with us so that the benefits are very clear and um, the public support is there. That's a big mm -hmm. process um, mm -hmm. element. Uh, for the Metro as well, that's a great way for community members to help continue to ensure their priorities are advanced. Okay. And yeah. I, think, I think from a TSP perspective, we can do a better job of explaining it as well. And yeah. That's something I think with our next update, yeah. we're going to be looking at our financial exactly. plan. And when we're looking at that, we can, we can 
figure out a way to, to tell that story about how this actually all was working. Yeah. Uh, that would be great, that. actually. Yeah. And, and that would, would really have a, a big am impact, um, especially on the yeah, trust that, that in, um, yeah. people have in yeah. government. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. You know, it's absolutely pretty, yeah. And tying it, I think, more clearly to the capital plan too, which is where you can really start to say how this matches up. So I think we want to mm -hmm. improve that as well. So we okay. appreciate your input. So, if no. if if it's okay, I think that was a great conversation. Thank you, Katie. Uh, if we could make sure we kind of stick to, I'm just looking at time now. Um, kind of yeah. what the hearing matter is at hand. I know Chris has an amendment he'd like to float on the table. Are there specific questions regarding? Um, the proposal? Sorry, I'm sorry. Sure. I was just going to respond to the testimony directly or only if there's a question from. I think at this point, if the, just if there's a question, thank you so much for asking, though, Courtney. I think why don't you okay. take it from here, Chris? All right. So I'll make uh, one remark in passing uh, that addresses another point in testimony to my friends from Bike Loud and the uh, replacing LOS. Uh, nothing would make me happier. Uh, I took a crack at it in the comp plan. Um, and got convinced at that point that, that just putting language in the TSP to do it uh, wouldn't be helpful, that PBOT really has to have the institutional infrastructure set up to be able to administer a rule like that. And I'm impatient, but I believe they're working hard on it. So um, I hope it happens before my term on this commission is over, but trying to inject it in tonight's language would, would probably not produce any useful outcome. Uh, so I do wanna focus on Sandy and just to refresh the context here, you know, I tried to do this during the last TSP update and got told that the right time to do that would be when we aligned um, the Metro RTP with the TSP, which is where we're at now. Uh, and really what I was trying to get at then is it had been eight years since we passed the Bicycle Master Plan, which is where we came up with the network. Um, eight years is a long time. We've learned a lot of things. I thought it was time to take another look at the major city bikeway network. Uh, we've sort of done that by using Metro's data uh, but not completely to my satisfaction. And I think you know, Bike Loud gave a lot of reasons why Sandy is, would be a good major city bikeway. Uh, my analysis is more common sense. It's just that we have two big diagonals in our network and those provide more direct routes for people on bikes or any mode for that matter. Uh, and therefore they should be part of the network. Uh, happily, the Metro data pointed to Foster. So we're there, we got to that. Um, and I'd like to include Sandy in that. So, the, so my common sense analysis says yes, your analysis uses the metro data, says no. Uh, I'll add a third framing to maybe be the tiebreaker here, which is that policy 9.6 says we prioritize pedestrians, cycling, transit, a bunch of shared modes, and then SOVs at the bottom, right? So the fact that Sandy has the highest classification for every other available classification, but not for bikes, says to me that we have not applied policy 9.6 in this context, and I'd like to correct that. So. Uh, my motion is that we classify Sandy Boulevard from Southeast Washington to Northeast 122nd as a major city bikeway. I second. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Cascade, all right. <laughs> Great, okay. So any dis further discussion on this item? <laughs> Eli? Well, that is my route when I'm not feeling safe. Um, and it's also got the great advantage that um, the only other way to get to Northeast Portland is you go up Williams and you go out going. I bike all the time with people doing exactly that, tight, biking 40% longer because it's not safe to go on Sandy. Um, so I'm a strong supporter of this. Yep. I mean, very quickly, uh, it is not my route, but Foster is. And what has happened with Foster is such a huge game changer um, that I think that that is data that we might not have had before. So, okay, yes, thank you. Katie, will you? Okay, are there any other questions, comments? I'm not seeing any, so I think we can take the vote on the, oh, Chris, help me here. We take the vote on the amendment and then the, the full proposal. Okay, let's. I have one more comment before we get to the full proposal. Great. Julie? Okay, back rack. Aye. Bordalazzo? Yes. Hauk? Yes. Larcel? Aye. Ralph? Aye. Smith? Yes. Spivak? Yes. Schultz? Yes. That passes unanimously. One other thought I'd like to add, and this would probably not be in the main motion, but in our letter, um, Southwest in motion is going to get adopted by council hopefully in early December before this goes to council. So um, I would suggest that we include in our letter the notion that 
uh, assuming council adopts Southwest in motion uh, as expected, that those projects be amended into the TSP as this goes to council. So direct staff that if, if that's adopted to go ahead and add them to the council proposal for the TSP update. So they don't have to wait another two years to get into the TSP. I'm certainly comfortable with that. Looks like we're getting a bunch of head nods. I think we're all comfortable with adding that to okay. the letter. Thank and you, I would Chris. be happy to move that we recommend the minor TSP update as amended. Do I have a second? Second. Great. Do I have any further questions, comments, deliberations? Um, is this a, if I may, is this a, a, a moment where we can add other comments that we'd like to include in a letter? Or is that passed? N no, um, we certainly can. I okay. think we're, I, I process-wise, we probably should vote on Great. the motion at hand, unless it's related to the motion. Close that out, and then we can certainly talk about the letter. Great. Okay. Any other comments regarding the motion on the table? No. Julie, you want to call the roll, please? Akrat? Aye. Bordelazzo? Aye. Auk? Aye. Marcel? Aye. Rao? Aye. Smith? Aye. Feedback? Aye. Aye. It passes unanimously. So, staff, what else would you like to add to the letter? I'm going to be try to be very quick because I am also mindful of time. Um, I just um, I wonder how we can a general comment um, given last time uh, last week we had an update of the climate action plan um, uh, and the the importance the role that transportation plays in um, in our climate action goals and how we are behind curve related to um, lowering VM or uh, decreasing VMT so I'd just love if how that we contextualize the importance of the transportation system plan in achieving our climate goals as a city. Comments? I think you're getting thumbs up. So that sounds like you've got support. We'll work on that. Mike, is that something? No, I was just going <laughs> to close the loop on my, on my earlier comment. It, it occurred to me I didn't explain why the red electric trips that I've been doing are called the cheapskate tour. You did not. You only pay going up the tram. <laughs> if you walk on the greenway up to OHSU, you go down for free. So for those who, whose interest may have been piqued and want to do that loop, it's, it's a great trip. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uphill both ways. <laughs> go <in> the <laughs> great. <laughs> Thank you very much for sharing. Thank you for your time here tonight. With that, we are adjourned. Thanks.